think we're live. TikTok, time to rock. We'll know in about oh. 30 seconds. I am having a couple of uh, the internet's running a little slower than normal tonight. So hopefully that won't be any problems. All right. I see us live over here. All right. Guess uh, kind of good morning to everyone. It's 2 o'clock in the morning. Um, if, uh, if you don't know what's going on here, um, I made a video a couple weeks ago about uh situation with my kids actually check this out i got an extra camera angle over here what look at that <laughs> that's what's in front of me i just connected a camera right there you see on the left there reed is sleeping on the right paley is still awake he's over there playing on an ipad um he must have taken a nap earlier in the day when i was asleep because uh, he is not tired at all now. So he is up with me in the middle of the night. And that means you're going to get some alarms uh, while we're talking here. Because uh, uh, just if he's moving around stuff, almost anything, any sort of movement, if he shifts one direction or coughs or anything like that, it'll set off this alarm uh, with the pressure thing. So um, you'll be hearing a little bit from Paley. And he will eventually start playing some music or song or something on that iPad. You'll probably hear it in the background. All right, so I'm here with my friend Vocab. Now, I'm up all night, Vocab, um, because I have to be. We, uh, we, uh, we, have a week, we have a nurse during the week uh, at night, and we have a nurse during the week during the day. But on the weekends, we have no nurse, so my wife Marie watches the kids during the day, and then I watch the kids at night. And so mentioned uh, last week that um since i was up all night we would just go live and vocab and i went live and talked about basically anything that anyone wants to talk about over in the chat we'll go ahead and uh just chat and so the idea is if if you guys are up then we're up and we might as well talk about some stuff rather than you know whatever else we might be doing all right now vocab and i uh vocab just saw bumblebee and he started telling me about it. <laughs> he started telling me about it when we're uh, when we're getting on Skype and stuff. And uh, I told him just save it, just save it for the live stream because this movie this doesn't even come out. This movie doesn't even come out for two weeks. I couldn't even find any reviews on it, which means that reviewers haven't even seen it yet. Or if they have seen it, they're they're sworn to silence and secrecy. So, uh, how did you how did you come by this uh, Bumblebee movie and cup? Well, the producers approached me and said, hey, we heard you have 10,000 subscribers on YouTube. Would you like some free early tickets? <laughs> Wait, who did this? No, I, I'm just totally <laughs> just BSing. That's not, that's not. Michael is, Bay. <laughs> yeah, Michael Bay, yeah. John Cena was hanging out. <laughs> uh, nah, but what happened is, uh, you know, Instagram reads your mind. And so I get these advertisements that pop up and they're like, see the bumblebee movie early all you got to do is and i'm like what like they're doing this again i guess now like these early release things for like super fans and you can mm -hmm. get in it doesn't seem to cost anymore from what i can gather uh and you just you could go as long as there's seats and if you're in a big city you can find them so it was actually kind of simple and it oh man it was awesome we had to drive to a pretty far away theater to do it 35 minutes but my kids were shocked because they're like how's it how, how it doesn't come out yet, you know, so it was fun, though. It was mm -hmm. a lot of fun. So uh, it didn't have anything to do with my clout, but check it out. They uh, they nailed the 80s aspect of it. Really? That's, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The soundtrack. So I'm not going to give away any spoilers away, by the way, but the soundtrack alone, they're throwing in, you know <sighs> – the Smiths and and they got a you know the famous Breakfast Club uh, ending that's a prominent part of the movie. The Breakfast like Club they, ending? What do you mean when when Bender walks out and holds his hand? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's a prominent part of the don't movie. Don't you yeah, forget don't, about me? Don't, don't, don't. <laughs> oh man, no, they killed one. it. They killed it with that and and uh like the, the it wasn't making fun of the eighties. They just incorporated it perfectly. It's set in 1987, and so there's cassette tapes and everything else. So, cannot that, that that's a major thing. I think that's a sort of a fan service, and they did have some um, throwback elements 
to what's called G1. If you're a big nerd, you know the G1 means Generation 1 of Transformers. They didn't only stay there, even though it was in the 80s, mm-hmm. but nonetheless, they gave much proper nods, especially the prologue and the epilogue to the movie. That's kind of the mm-hmm. key places. So you, this is a movie you cannot get there late. The, the, the beginning of the movie totally establishes its credibility as a legitimate G1 fan service Transformers movie and is some of the coolest action you could imagine. My kids are still freaking out about one little sequence that was less than five seconds long. They, like what, they just are talking about this one little part that's in the beginning of the movie where, uh, Soundwave, ah, the Soundwave, Soundwave. A character. Yeah. Soundwave, oh, Soundwave yeah. was my favorite Transformer Rubbish. of all time. You, you know, you, you know why? On the original series, he was like completely loyal to Megatron. Mm-hmm. Well, like Starscream's always trying to betray him, but mm-hmm. uh, but Soundwave, as you command, Megatron. He was, he was always like that. I always thought that was cool. And plus, you the know, way he just, it works. He just, plus, he just he just rolled in as his own separate army. Totally. I'm see. I'm kind of like your Soundwave and John McCray. He's more like Star. Uh, yeah, Starscream. He's more like your Starscream. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. And I'm Megatron. <laughs> <laughs> but, but uh, nah, man. There's there is a fight between Starscream and Bumblebee. Oh, it's 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 great. It is great. What, they, it, what is it? Is it just is it just Bumblebee and a, and a bunch of bad guys? No. So I'm telling you parts that I particularly like. Mm-hmm. But it's my complaint about the movie would be, and I'm not a big action movie guy in the sense that everything needs to be nonstop action. Mm-hmm. I'm not into that. Like I need a story. I need good dialogue. I need the movie to be intelligent. Pure action is usually not able to express the intelligence that I do care about in a movie. However, I'm telling you about these certain parts because I love them. But the movie moves pretty slow at points. Now, that's a good um, contrast to the Bay movies, which were not comfortable to ever sit still mm-hmm. and to have intelligent dialogue. So and this, wait, this is not Michael Bay? No, no, it's a different guy. Good. Travis, Travis Good. Knight, I think. He gets it, though. And, in fact, the design, they totally went retro on it. So a My, car Michael panel. Bay, Michael Bay reminds me of uh, Zack Snyder in the sense that they can think if you just throw a massive budget and tons of CGI – Screw the writers. Screw having mm-hmm. good writers writing a good story. And I'm always thinking, gosh, if you're spending $150, $200 million on a movie, spend an extra $500,000 on an awesome writer who can write some uh, an awesome story with some awesome dialogue and then throw all your CGI stuff in there, right? And then, yeah. yeah but like- it, it, but it's, like, it, it's like they're saying, hey, you know, uh, all we have to do is, is – uh, kick 150 million dollars into this, and we're gonna make we're gonna make 500 million dollar profit, and it doesn't matter what we do because the CGI people are gonna show up for. Screw the story, and uh, you know, well. Oh, Matthew Scarborough's making uh, an interesting thing. He's saying uh, it might have been Blitzwing, not Starscream. So for those who know, Blitzwing is also a Decepticon jet, but he transforms into a jet about as well Thundercracker. as a tank. Thundercracker's not in it. If it was Blitzwing, which I think you're right because I heard someone mention him, this Blitzwing that they have looks just like Starscream. If it is Blitzwing, I don't I don't know, but they do have what Blitzwing is. Either way, a triple changer. So in the original Transformers of G1, there's robots who could have three modes: two vehicle forms and a robot mode. This movie has triple changers, oh. so they look they look freaking awesome when they go from hot rods. To, to uh to helicopters and then hot rods into airplanes and then back to robots, which is a real thing from G one Generation One Transformers. So I was all about that as well. Okay. It's 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 easy to get the just so everyone knows it's easy to get the jets. Um the the G one Transformers sometimes they would use the exact same Transformer toy and just paint it differently. Yep, they and would it would do be that. a different it would be a different uh, a different character. Yeah, guys, I'm not gonna. So, I'm not so, gonna give yeah, any spoilers. Yes, people are complaining. Stop away, spoiling no. the movie. No one's spoiling the movie. I haven't seen the movie. How am I gonna spoil the movie? I haven't given any spoilers though. I don't think in any in any way. The, the, no. uh, there's no. You, you mentioned points. you mentioned that there's a scene with Soundwave. So if that's too much for you, then that yeah, that's don't listen in to the trailer. That's in the trailer. That's in the. So you could have seen all of this in the trailer. All the stuff I'm saying. It's basically a coming of age story. It's sort of a girl and her her dog who becomes her best friend type story. You know, it's that kind of thing. So it gets slow at points. It gets sappy at points. But I could tell because I was by, I was mainly surrounded by like um, like a lot of 
kind of millennials were there, actually. I could tell they were totally into it. So the movie doesn't disappoint the old school fans, but these the millennials were like with it. I could tell 100%. They were like feeling it because it hit their sensibility. So I think it's going to do really well. Um, is it perfect? I mentioned the dialogue. I'm just saying it's not as bad as Michael Bay's stuff. It's not like some perfect, flawless – like the movie really is not that deep. Like mm-hmm. I like to do the philosophical analysis on movies. This movie, it would be a strain to do a whole lot of philosophical mm-hmm. analysis because it's not much present there. You'd have to focus kind of on some issues with family. That's a key thing. You have to focus on on things like that, but it doesn't have a massive amount mm-hmm. of that. So that's that's not what it's about. But it's definitely a feel good overall. There's a little bit of language, but the sexualization of women is almost absent from the movie. Like. Uh, which is nice, again, comparing to Michael Bay, who over-sexualized almost every woman in any way that was there. That doesn't really happen. Even uh, Megan Fox? Well, you remember the Michael Bay movies, close-ups on lips and all this slow-motion running with low-hanging shirts. It was just out of control. No, it was all like, hey, there is no way this Victoria's Secret model is the special scientist in your secret laboratory here. You know what I mean? Yeah. So these um th- this movie is a pretty good family movie and it's a movie that I don't think will disappoint newer or older. Again, it's not perfect. It's not very d- deep. It's definitely not a very in-depth movie, but I don't see how almost anyone could go to the movie and not have fun and not enjoy it. Mm. Like I see people who don't even like Transformers that much liking it cuz they make Bumblebee so much like the perfect pet dog of of all time. Like so expressive and he's so cute you know that kind of thing but man he's dope because he's a uh, he's riding around in his little vw and they do these crazy car chases but it's this little vw and uh you know he's he, it's just cool it's cool when he goes into a uh, fight mode too like the action is well done i mean you can actually tell what's going on and um that's a shocker yeah because again very different than the Bay movies, right? So this is a much smaller movie. Like it really focuses on the relationship with this girl and Bumblebee, uh, and uh, which which is fine. She's she's a relatively likable character. Like she seems legit in it. You know what I'm saying? She's not. Um, she seems legit. You know, kind of a kind of a tomboy, but not out of control with it. It's, so it's man, it's it's legit. I give it I give it two thumbs up, no doubt, and. I think a lot of people are going to be very happy with it. I encourage people to see it when it does drop. I think you're going to see a lot of positive reviews about it. Yeah, I can't I'm, see I'm it. going to wait on the reviews. I don't uh, entirely trust your judgment on Transformers movies because I watched the first one and I was done, and that was apparently the best one compared to the others. So if you're like, I never, oh, uh, oh, I can't wait to see Bumblebee, I'm like, yeah, all right. Let me get a let me get a, a second, third, fourth, and fifth opinion on this one. But, I never gave those other movies positive reviews, so what do you mean? You know you watched like, them. <laughs> of course I watched them. They're Transformers. I don't, them. Have, a, I don't <laughs> have a choice to Bo-Cab's watch like, Dark Side of the Moon is the greatest movie I've ever seen in my life. I know why you liked it, because it's similar to a Pink Floyd uh I like album. that. Yeah, the Pink, yeah they're, trying to, they're, they're biting off a of Pink Floyd there, trying to, trying to get some people to watch it. All right, uh, no, Ni- those- Niall said, hey, David and Vocab, doesn't the Kaaba look like a Transformer in disguise? That would yeah, be, that would be. How would that be in a in a Transformer movie, right? The cube. He's talking about the big black cube that gives them their. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a. That's actually funny. That would be an interesting skit to have the cop. Well, yeah, yeah. I'm just thinking, how cool would that be, like in an actual Transformers movie? You know, Bumblebee's <laughs> over there, and then the Kaba transforms and starts starts blasting people. Right. That's he's legit. been absor- he's been absorbing, he's been absorbing evil for all these centuries. Hey, hey! By, by the way, for everyone who thinks that was that was mean, um, according to Islam, the black stone was originally white, but it absorbs people's sins, and so so much of it that that it's now uh, black. And so uh, there is some of that going on. But but imagine that oh. the black stone is like this power absorber. <laughs> it like abs- it's the it absorbs spark. it absorbs sin to make like this like evil. Decepticon matrix of leadership and then like that that powers the Kaaba anyway you could do some crazy you people could do some crazy interesting stuff if they weren't scared of getting their heads chopped off that kind of is oh hey hey by the way before we before we 
before we before we get into some of our topics here, we were mentioning this earlier. I said it kind of as a joke, but then I realized how awesome it was because uh, Robert was saying that he wanted the truth his his book, The Truth About Muhammad, which is a biography of Muhammad, to be mm-hmm. made into a movie, but no one wanted to do it. And I said, what would be awesome is if we did a Lego stop motion version of it because and, and you could put at the beginning hey legos are the only things that you know aren't worried about getting their heads chopped off so the entire movie had to be made with legos and then i said what if we made it a rap opera lego it, stop motion life of muhammad rap opera do you know i've written a rap opera before wait wait is that the one that james was in yeah 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 i i wrote <laughs> I wrote about a quarter of that script, maybe a little bit more. So, and if I, I, so if one I were year to, they had me co-direct. If I were to get you together with uh, Mike and Tony from Hazakim, maybe one or two other people of your choice, and to give them the historical details, basically give each of you a copy of the truth, the truth about Muhammad, and say, turn this into a rap opera. You guys would be responsible for doing the soundtrack, coming up with all the songs, and I would get a different team to do the Lego stop motion. You're saying we could actually do this two hour rap opera, Life of Muhammad. That sounds like a super expensive project, but also super epic. Could it be done? Could it be done? Yo, it could definitely be done. There's no doubt about that. Like, <laughs> that could be, there's so many things you could do. You could, um, oh man, I'm just, Oh man, there's so much you could do because oh. you could have the poets, you could have the poets appear, oh. and all the poets that he killed, and they could like battle Muhammad. But, yeah, but they could, they, yeah, they're all the rappers, and he's got to keep killing them. <laughs> yeah, but instead of battling, he just dude, could, could you, could you, uh, could, you uh, could you imagine uh, Asma bint Marwan? <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. She's they, like the yes, she jumping yes. up, she jumping up like the brat, <laughs> and she, Muhammad has to kill her. <laughs> that would be. She, uh, is it her or is it a different lady? She'd be like rapping while she's holding her babies. Yeah, yeah. And then they, well, it gets kind of dark real quick, actually. Uh, but yeah, that would be dope, man. Hey, by the way, I saw Glory Apologetics up in here. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I forget where I, I, I. And actually, it looks like there's a number of people visiting tonight from uh from India, which is awesome. That's the benefit of us being on in the middle of the night. It's a regular time for people around the world. That's kind of one of the reasons I wanted to do it because lots of people complain. I, you know, I, I normally do my live streams at like eight o'clock at night and stuff. Right. And some people are like, "No, that's the middle of the night here," or "No, I'm at work during that time." And so, uh, doing one on the weekend on a at a different time uh, might work out. All right. Well, uh, Anything else you wanted to add on the movie front before we jump into a topic here? You would enjoy it. Your kids would enjoy it. But you're not going to leave and say it's like as awesome or epic as, you know, the the last Avengers or anything like that. It's not going to be like that. It'll just be more enjoyable. But I think most of the people in the in a live chat will dig it, too. Like I said, there's only a little bit of language and violence is not – it's almost negligible as far as like – actually like oh that's violent and uh maybe the what's your face girl could dress a tad bit more modest on certain things but there's nothing even sexual in it mm-hmm. so i'm i'm about that's for that's sort of the moral you know parents common sense side of it and the other side they totally respect the property they give much love to the 80s in which the property kind of lives and breathes and yet i know they're going to reel in a bunch of new people and so it's kind of like a perfect reboot like the way they did it was perfect, even though my main com- negative comment, this is my summary review, is there's parts where it's too slow. They kind of overdo some of the their relationship between Bumblebee and the girl a little bit where it kind of slows it. I'm like, okay, I get it. He's in pain and she doesn't want to watch. Okay, I get it. Neither of my friends. Okay, I get it. They're both coming of age. Okay, I get it. Please m- move on. There's a couple times where it's like that, but nothing where I just had to turn away or cringe or said, oh, my gosh. Like I did time and time again with Bay movies. Mm -hmm. So that's a thumbs up. And I'll drink to that out of my Bumblebee glass. Um, Yo, uh, I see some of the people been uh, telling us where they're from. Why doesn't everyone uh, go ahead and uh, share with us where you're from? We're about to jump into a topic. I did want to bring up one more point on the Transformers because you mentioned um, sort of examining the movies 
philosophically. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's something I've always done. And I remember when I was, uh, I don't remember how old I was when th the movie came out. Um, Transformers, the movie. I don't mean the Michael Bay. 86. I mean, yeah, the, the cartoon. 86. Yeah. And, uh, of course, like half the Transformers in that movie die. Yeah. And, uh, uh, I mean, like half of the G1 Transformers die. The Dinobots are still around. Uh, yep. Bumblebee's still around. Prime comes back later, but they, basically they just start killing them off left and right in this big war. And then, uh, uh, even even Megatron gone, a bunch of those guys gone. I mean, he gets changed into Galvatron and stuff. But uh, back then, I was examining it philosophically, and I was thinking, isn't it cool that they're trying to teach us kids about death? Because you know, yeah, your heroes are eventually going to die, and you can't just keep going into all these big fights and acting like everything's going to be all right and everyone's going to come out. It's fine. It's cool that they're finally getting real with us and showing us. That, you know, your heroes are going to die eventually and we're all going to die. And they're introducing this concept of death to us. And I didn't figure out until like six or seven years ago. I was thinking about it. I was like, they just did that to give us a bunch of new toys, right? <laughs> they're like, Yeah, here's the reason they did it, David. What? I have, by the way, this is the Transformers action figure Bible right here. Mm -hmm. The ultimate Transformers guide. Here's the reason they did it. This is the last page of the 1985 figures. Mm -hmm. and this is the first page of the 1986 figures. They wanted a way to introduce all the 1986 figures, exactly. Yeah, but the so things they had no idea, the attachment, the emotional attachment that boys all over the world had to these characters, and they didn't realize what it would do. But in hindsight, it makes the movie epic because the, the stakes in the movie are immediately raised. Although it is a little bit unconventional to kill off all your most popular people right in the beginning of the movie and then do the rest of the movie with people no one knows about. Very unconventional, but it makes it kind of an epic movie. Like I, I think it's still fun to watch the 86 movie. Yeah, By yeah, the way, yeah. I, I just, thought, I just thought that was a jerk well. move, right? They're like, oh, yeah. look, most of the kids who love Transformers have all the main Transformers. We can occasionally introduce new Transformers, or we could just do a movie, kill everyone off, and introduce an entire new squad that's sometime in the future. And uh, again, when I was a kid, I thought there was a different reason, and now that I grew up, and nope, that was money. They were, they were, hey, let's kill off all your heroes, kids, to get more money out of you, because now you, now you, now you have to buy Rodimus Prime, which I didn't even like. All right. You know what's weird? My kids love Rodimus, though. They think he's really? like the coolest thing. It's it's the flames, and I think they kind of relate to him because he's I, I, impetuous. I'm, I'm, ta I'm talking about the I'm talking about the toy. Uh, oh, the toy was really yeah. Because I, I was I was a little kid, right? I was I was a little yeah, kid. And I had uh, I had the, I had Optimus Prime for some reason. It was just more fun to play with than Rodimus Prime. It's like they got it's like they got cheaper in the toys. It's no, no, like they, they got did. Cheaper. Uh, eighty four and eighty five. They used die cast metal parts, yeah. so they actually had metal pieces and they and cut after that they were out. plastic. Yeah, almost entirely in 86, and the other big difference in 86 is they left real-world vehicles. So Bumblebee's a VW, the, mm -hmm. the Seeker Jets are uh, F-15s, mm -hmm. stuff like that. The, in 86, things became futuristic and unrecognizable, so uh, it, it made a big difference. <laughs> hey, hey, you remember this one? When they brought, uh, they brought Optimus Prime back to life, and... Uh... They brought Optimus Prime back to life, and then he supposedly died again, crashing into a star. Uh, those things with the four faces. Remember those things? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, you, I think they had five faces. It's the, um, the Pe Quint Penta Quint yeah, Quintessons. Yeah, Quintessons. Yeah. Yeah. They had the, the uh, organic parts, the tentacles. So they, brought, so they brought Optimus Prime back to life, but he was, like, controlled by them. And then he goes and supposedly crashes into a star, but then they bring him back for this two-parter where... There's this, uh, there are these spores that are taking over and turning everyone evil, and so they bring in... Yeah. Yeah. That and so, epic. uh, Bumblebee gets, uh, messed up or something like this, and then, uh, he gets, he gets turned, he gets plated in gold somehow, and he says, hey, now I'm a gold bug! And Optimus Prime is like, well, that's what you'll be from now on. Gold bug! And, and then they came out with a toy. That's one. Yeah, that's one where I actually spotted it. You guys wanted us to buy a new Bumblebee car because <laughs> you know he's popular. <laughs> These yep. guys are dirt bags, man. We're dealing with dirt bags. <laughs> oh man! But it worked because thirty years later, Transformers went from you know little transforming robot cars into major motion pictures. Yeah. All right. Uh. All right, so let's go into uh, 
topic right here, and I have a comment that will introduce it for us. Milo, it's from James Saul, Milo and Sargon have nothing to do with Christian apologetics or Christianity. Why is Sargon the lead to this video live stream? Come on now. Mm. Well, uh, I don't know if you guys have noticed, but uh, if you think these issues aren't relevant, you have no clue what you're talking about, right? Um, there are times in history where you can't exactly say what you want. And... Uh, very di there are places right now in the world where you can't say what you want, right? Go ahead and ask Asya Bibi whether it's important to stand up when people start trying to silence or marginalize people based on what they say, right? So we have something special in certain parts of the world where we can say what we want. We can have open discussions. Um, there are limits. There are limits to what you are allowed to legally say. You can't just make up horrible things about someone and spread them around. You, that, that is that is illegal. Uh, you can't do stuff that's going to get people trampled to death. Like if you're going to yell, the classic example is if you're going to yell fire in a crowded theater, you're only supposed to do that if there's an actual fire. Then you could do it. But if there's not a fire, uh, you can't do that sort of thing. Um, and then we get to issues like issues with Milo and Sargon. Now, um, Milo Yiannopoulos, um, for those of you who don't know, we'll give, we'll give a quick rundown here. Milo Yiannopoulos, he's a guy who came out a couple years ago, and uh, most people had never heard of him before. But he was sort of a professional at provoking people, right? He was good at really ticking off people, and it was at a time when lots of people were just fed up with all the sniveling crybaby students on college campuses who uh, are, are whining about microaggressions and having their safe spaces and things like that. He's just, uh, I mean, just they, they can't take anything. People are sick of that. Um, and these were the people who, as sensitive as they were, would not hesitate to heap abuse on anyone who disagree with them. To, they would yell racist at anyone who disagreed with them about anything. Oh, you disagree with this policy on this? It's because you're a racist. And they start shouting people down as racists and so on. Um, so Milo came out and just really started ticking these people off. And it was hard to criticize him because he's gay. <laughs> and that made it really difficult, right? Because... Uh, they would try to lump everyone together as, you know, whatever it is, fundamentalist or something like this. And Milo comes out and he's a gay guy, but he's 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 condemning um, a sort of nutbag leftist. And I don't just mean, you know, you, there is a there is a reasonable place on the political spectrum. You could be Republican or, or Democrat and have good ideas, but you can be so far out on one side, either side that. Um, you're going to you're going to cause a lot of problems and things, especially on college campuses, had been swinging in that direction, like further and further. Like you didn't just have to be on the left side of the political spectrum; you had to be radical left, or you're you're too far right, right? If you're anything besides radical left, anyway. Milo comes on stage, starts really ticking everyone off, and uh, became popular mainly because he was ticking off people that a lot of people think needed to be ticked off. And that's something that you had a parallel situation with Donald Trump, right? There are people who like Donald Trump. There are people who like Donald Trump as a businessman. There are people who think he'd be a good leader. But there were people who voted for Donald Trump who just were voting for him because he was ticking off people that they really didn't like, right? People who had been heaping abuse on them for years um, calling them bigots, and here's the guy who's ticking them off and enraging them. So people liked that. People liked that about him. Uh, so they so Milo was before that, um, but eventually he had all kinds of problems in that um, he really liked he he loved to provoke people so much that eventually he was doing it in ways that uh, alienated a lot of his fan base. So he lost a lot of his popularity, lost a lot of uh, his, his, his uh, speaking uh, invitations, and um, was, was frankly, to be clear, he was saying some, some horrible things. He was, you, you can look him up. You can look up the, thing, the kinds of things that he was saying that really uh, alienated him from a lot of his fan base. Um, so there's, there's that situation, and 
Uh, he, just a few days ago, tried to start a, a Patreon account, Patreon campaign, for him to, you know, continue doing what he's doing. Uh, I was shut down almost immediately. So that's Milo. And so the question for those of you here would be, um, if Milo is basically a, a professional provocateur, and that's what he does, um, should Patreon, should Patreon um, allow him to use their platform or not allow him to use their platform. And just keep in mind, this is different. This is different from straightforward freedom of speech issues because Patreon is a company, right? Freedom of speech. Normally, when we're talking about freedom of speech, what we mean is, uh, if we're talking about a place like the United States of America, freedom of speech is basically a right that's protecting you from the government. So the First Amendment is telling the government what it can and cannot do. And the government can't stop most forms of speech. Again, there are limitations. Um, so this isn't uh, saying you can't be on our platform or you can't use our platform is not the same thing as the government silencing someone. So he ha he's not being silenced by the government. Uh, so in the, the reason we're dealing with this is this is an important issue for everyone. Um, Christian apologists, uh, more so with people who speak and criticize Islam, because guess what? There are all kinds of people who say that we shouldn't be allowed to criticize Islam. Not on YouTube, not on Twitter, not on Facebook, not on the Internet. There are people who make these claims, um, and they are sometimes successful. My channel is still still up, but I have had videos uh, removed by YouTube without explanation. And others have had channels entirely removed, things like that. People have been removed from Twitter. T Tommy Robinson, regardless of what you think about Tommy's, uh, you know, anything he said in the past or something like this, he was removed from YouTube, I mean, from Twitter, for saying Islam promotes killing. So Twitter said, ah, you just said Islam promotes killing. Uh, that is unacceptable on our platform. You have to be banned. And I immediately jumped in there like what do you mean what what do you think muhammad meant when he said if anyone leaves his islamic religion kill him that sounds like it's promoting killing there it sounds like it's promoting killing and the response of lots of people was ah but you know you could look at the old testament and it promotes yeah yeah you shouldn't be banned for saying hey these old testament verses promote killing you shouldn't be banned off something for that right you could you could point to chapter and verse why would you ban someone for that sort of thing so Getting people shut down from these platforms uh, is very real to us. In fact, I I feel on a regular basis like it's right around the corner. YouTube shuts us down. Twitter shuts us down. Facebook shuts us down. Right? Especially doing we're kind of we're we kind especially with things like Islamicize me and stuff. We kind of push it as far as we can as as far as we can go. Right? And so if If anyone's going to get blocked for basically peaceful content, because you, you know, just to be clear, if if you are saying, "Hey, kill Muslims" or something like that, they're 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 going to ban you, and they they should ban you for something like that. Um, but we are in the realm of peaceful content. We're criticizing an ideology. We're criticizing a uh, a man who's been dead for fourteen centuries. Uh, we're criticizing his claims. But we're not advocating for hurting anyone. We're against that. Um, and we're, we're doing it because our goal is, is ultimately to, to help people. So, but with that said, we, we push the envelope, envelope a lot. We, we, go, we go pretty hard in, in what we do. And so when we see platforms like Patreon uh, banning Milo, I have to say, okay, what, what's this guy do? Basically, he provokes a lot of people. Well, we provoke a lot of people, right? Milo's not out killing anyone. Um, so what's going on? Uh, that's something that could affect us, not just on Patreon, on YouTube, on Twitter, on Facebook, on the internet. And there are people who say, hey, it, it doesn't matter. No, no, it does matter. It, it, it does matter. If you, All of a sudden, we're not allowed to uh, use the main uh, platforms of communication in the world. Because, guys, especially if you're a Christian, we have never had Christians have never had opportunities like we have today to share information around the world. There are people watching and you guys are already posting all the different places around the world where you're watching from. 
right? People around the world are watching this right now. Why? Because we, we have a way to do that, right? We, we're able to do that on YouTube. This is amazing. It's amazing to be able to do stuff like this. So when I see major companies, major platforms saying, ah, no, you're, you, you go a little too far, Milo. So you didn't even make it a day on the platform. Um, that's a concern. Unless you show, hey, here's where you violated a clear policy of our um, website, of our platform. And since you violated this policy, uh, you have to go. If that were the case and I look at the, I look at the policies and I say, well, I haven't, I haven't violated any of these policies, so I'm good to go. If that were the situation, that would be one thing. But that's not what has happened. Um, I haven't examined the case with, with Milo. Uh, very much, but uh, I did examine the case with Sargon. Now, just to be clear, I don't follow these guys very much. I, I, watch, I would watch some of Lo, uh, Milo's lectures back in the day where he would show up to tick everyone off because I was watching it from, a, from the perspective of how much is he going to get away with before they shut him down. So I was very interested in it uh, from that perspective. Um, Sargon... Uh, I've watched a couple of Sargon's videos, but I don't watch a lot of people on, on YouTube. If I'm watching YouTube, I'm trying to be entertained because my brain is fried. Um, so I don't watch a lot of, a lot of people's content. If I'm watching something, you know, I'll click on uh, vocab or John's video or something like that. Some usually, usually people I know. Um, I've watched a couple of uh, Sargon's videos. Uh, you know, his discussion on Kathy Newman back when the Kathy Newman had the, the little, uh, little exchange with Jordan Peterson. I watched that because that was, that was interesting, uh, but haven't followed a lot. But when, when I heard he got banned, that was, that was, that was pretty wild because I'm thinking, what, what is he doing? He, 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 he makes YouTube videos, making fun of stuff and criticizing stuff, right? That's exactly what I do. So why, if he's getting banned, then I, I, you know, why could I not be next? So unless he violated some clear policy, and then you look at the rules, and he absolutely 100% did not violate any of their policies, right? If you go to their, their page on hate speech, it says that the only hate speech they're going to block you for is hate speech posted on Patreon. He never did. Um, if you look at what he's actually, uh, what they, how they justified um, shutting him down, I'll go ahead and tell you what it was. And Vocab, you can share your thoughts on this. Um, but basically, 10 months ago, he was on someone else's channel. He was on someone else's channel. And there were some modern Nazis in the, the chat or something like that. And they're, they're basically, they had been stalking him, right? Trying to shout him down and so on. And they're blasting around with the N-word. And then he calls them the N-word. Right. So he calls some white supremacists the N word and which I don't think he should do. But let's be clear. He's not he, he wasn't calling African-Americans the N word. He was calling white supremacists the N word. And he's saying exactly how you say that black people behave and this that this makes them inferior. This is exactly how you guys behave. Right. So he's, in effect, telling them, hey, what, what you are calling them a name for is exactly how you behave, and I'm going to call you the name. So <clears throat> I think that was a bad idea. Don't think that was a good way to go about it. But is that something that Patreon should be banning someone for? Well, it completely goes against everything they say in their policy. It completely goes against everything their CEO, CEO has said, because he said, and if you go to Sargon's page, he posts a video where he plays clips of what uh, Patreon's CEO uh, said about Patreon's policy. He said, it doesn't matter what you say on Twitter. It only matters what you say here. Well, guess what? That's what they say. That's their official policy. And yet they're shutting Sargon down for something that had absolutely nothing to do with violating Patreon's stated policies. So here's the situation I'm in. And that vocab's in here. When, when that sort of thing happens, hey, here are rules and guidelines. And 
hey, if we just feel like it one day, we're going we're gonna to say, screw our rules and guidelines. We'll just block you for not liking you or because we didn't like something you did. If they can do that, if, if they can do that, then now that affects everyone, right? That does. So if you're saying, hey, why are you guys talking about that? This affects us, right? This affects us um, because, you know, Patreon can do that. What happens when YouTube does that? What happens when Twitter does that? Um, and guess what? All, all of these groups do do that. I don't, I don't post content that violates any of YouTube's guidelines, and yet they take down my videos. They, they will take down my videos. No explanation, no appeal. There's supposed to be an explanation, and there's supposed to be an appeal. That's in the rules. They just don't do it. So you have situations where there are people working at these companies who can just shut you down, uh, who, can, who can start going after you. And the leaders of the companies don't seem to stand up uh, when this sort of thing happens. So I would say this is uh, very relevant to all of us. All right, Vocab, what are your thoughts on this? Well, I have less thoughts on this and more thoughts on the Bumblebee movie. <laughs> no, but in all seriousness, I, these are also folks that uh, I'm not ultra familiar with. But, um, you know, I see... I've seen some of them around. Mm -hmm. I've heard people mention their names kind of thing. And then when these things kind of happen, I'll go see, oh, what were they doing or what were they talking about? And I'll see, and I'll see, oh, they, you know, they had substantial um, influence in different sectors, and a lot of people seem to know who they are and stuff. So they're not in my circle either. It's not really about that. Um, I, I did watch one video, the one you sent me, though, on this, and I thought he made excellent points. Because there seems to be uh, the the policing that that some of these groups, these companies are doing, it seems to be very one sided mm -hmm. and um, in inconsistent and even illogical. And uh, you 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 just have to wonder why. And you, it's a bad it's a bad trend. It's a bad step in the in the wrong direction. And um, yeah, it's like where will they stop? Because mm -hmm. you could kind of tell they can justify it, and they don't really don't have to justify it, apparently, and they just do it, and they don't even really follow what they lay down. A lot of these policies are really unclear. Like, these are something you could probably never get away with if you had, like, an actual contract. Mm -hmm. You know, this like, the vague language, and, and the, the language they do have, or what they've said, uh, if it was some kind of binding contract, they'd, they'd be, I think, held liable, where they'd be like, hey, you need to follow through with what you said. So it is. It is troubling since social media is so important. Mm -hmm. And um, it, yeah, I mean, re really, like really, we we've we've been building we've been building our work around the availability of social media, right? Yeah, I mean, that's mm -hmm. where you. I mean, Christian apologetic Christian apologists historically go around speaking, right? Go around speaking, and then you know, a, a little more recently in the past few decades, they started getting to you know doing television or um, making DVDs and things. Uh, and then more recently, in the past decade, basically, um, some have switched over to uh, you know, using things like YouTube, focusing on things like YouTube. Most Christian apologists who do YouTube do it as secondary to going around and speaking and everything else they were doing. So we're some of the few who just said, no, we, we, will, go, we will go full time right. on, on platforms like YouTube. And so once you find out, as you, as you pointed out, that they can just, they, they can just sh shut down and don't really have to justify it, uh, that's scary. Because let's face it, if there's nothing in the Patreon policy, their stated policy on things like hate speech, if there's nothing in there that would prevent uh, Sargon from doing anything he's done, or that would suggest that there's any problem with anything Sargon has done, if there's nothing in their policy, then that means... He's being banned for something else. And what's he really being banned for? Well, he just brushes certain people the wrong way. And he's developed um, some angry uh, critics who are going around trying to get him shut down. And so that's the problem. If, if platforms like Patreon are going to surrender to the mob, right, or worse yet, if members of the mob are actually working at Patreon, well, guess what? They're working at YouTube as well. So those policies have to be enforced. 
not just on people who are violating them, but on people who are using them as excuses to shut people down who aren't even violating the policies. And so that's when you that's when you have to you just have to bring awareness to this and and point it out that it's happening and see what you can actually do about it. Um, go ahead, Vokam. Just... Don't these don't uh, makers of uh, like adult games aren't aren't they also on Patreon? Like I don't know all the details, but uh, I was reading in some. What of the sort of stuff that... are you looking at on Patreon, you pervert? No, in one of the comments, one of the videos you sent me. The yeah, my favorite said... game, this adult game, man. This funded by Patreon, man. <laughs> no, I think you're watching the you're watching the videos as far as as far yeah. as uh, the videos that I come out pointing out the hypocrisy. Uh, wait yeah, a minute, the, it's okay so to fund this on Patreon and not that, right? Yeah, that's 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 uh, seems troubling, and then. I guess Antifa's on there, Antifa, oh, yeah. and I mean uh, they've done and said some pretty out there things from what what I know about them, and mm -hmm. it seems like they're able to be on there. So again, I don't defend these, you know, what these guys did or say, but uh, I thought Patreon was almost supposed to be bigger than that. I mean, it's like yeah. meta. It's like, that's they're not about, you know, especially off platform. But that seems like that's what's going on. And uh, that's troubling because if it's not consistent, if it's not logical, if it's not predictable, if you can't expect it, if you can't explain it, it just – it shakes up the, the trust that's kind of built in there mm -hmm. because anybody could wake up one day and all their stuff is just gone and there was no yes. warrant. There was no process. There's no way to appeal it. That's uh, that's not good customer service to say the least. Yeah. So it's a, it seems problematic. And uh, one guy made a good point, you know, uh, I guess with some of these videos, they found these videos that are on other people's channels. So there, these weren't videos that had a high view count or channels with big subscribers. And then they're finding things in three-hour videos with exact time codes. So it seems, I guess, clear they're being kind of sent stuff, mm -hmm. but they're allowing the stuff they're getting sent to make them say, well, take action. Yep. So that's just uh, – that's uh, – that, uh, that all seems troubling. Hey, a couple people in the super chat I want to give a shout out to. Um, Unkindness of Ravens, great yeah. name. Yeah, I saw that. No, it's good because if they're talking about the Baltimore Ravens, yeah, the Baltimore Ravens fans are a bunch of jerks usually. Um, you know, so that's I never, true. So that is a good name. What? I, and I never. This is a Pittsburgh Steelers fan, I bet. I never Even knew they're watching years. from. Yeah. I never knew for years that the the Baltimore Ravens were named that because of the association with Edgar Allan Poe. Yeah, what a also, what a dumb reason to name a team, right? <laughs> I think it's kind of epic, honestly. I think that's a football team, which is like the dumbest sport ever. Tapping into literature, much props. About to get blocked, okay, for then, uh, talking trash. But go ahead. We got James Bellari, much love to you in the super chat. Nelson Gavin, much love to you in the super chat. And then she just came on. Hey, how you doing, Laura Jukic? Jukic, uh, Jukic, much love to you in the super chat as well. So yeah, we got some uh, great people coming on and talking. And uh, one one person made a comment. And they said, "Super chat for these guys because they're really transforming lives." And I don't know if they did that on purpose or not, but mm -hmm. I feel like they did it on purpose because it's right when we were talking about Bumblebee. So I see what you did there, even if you didn't see it. Whoever wrote that comment. <laughs> Um, but, uh, yeah, let, 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 let's start looking at some of the comments here that are related to this topic, um, because I actually understand that this is this is difficult and new territory. Right. Because, again, as I as I mentioned, this is not the same idea as mere freedom of speech. Right. Twitter is a company. YouTube is a company. Um, Patreon is a company. As a company, you can set rules for what is acceptable on your platform. You can say, hey, anything goes, say anything you want. You could say that. You could say, say anything except for, you know, directly promoting violence. You could say that. You could say, say anything except for these 10 different things. So you can make whatever rules you want. And a lot of these companies, they're on, this is new territory, right? Um, that... We're in a situation where, 
you know, in places like the United States, you can, if you're on the street, you can say whatever you want. You can say racist things. You can say horrible things. And the government will protect your right to say it. Not always. Sometimes they overstep the rules there. But generally, the, the United States has been uh, great at protecting uh, people's rights. So what happens when, uh, in the one sense, you know, platforms like YouTube and Twitter and Facebook are companies so they can set what rules they want. They can set whatever rules they want, but they are sort of really public forums, right? So it's, it's almost like it should be as open and free as it, as it can be. And so how do they, how do they, how do the companies navigate that, that, uh, that platform when this is a difficult issue because there are people going to be saying things that a lot of other people don't want to hear. So what do you do? Um, so that is a that is a difficult issue. But um, uh, Nadali here says, uh, David Wood, we don't need Patreon anymore. Better use uh, cryptocurrency. Uh, and that's where that's where I would actually object. Uh, you don't need Patreon in the sense of you could you will survive without Patreon. If Patreon boots us tomorrow, we'll survive. We'll, we'll, we'll make it. Um, but Patreon helps, right? YouTube helps. We'll survive without YouTube. We can survive without it. We can do something else. But YouTube helps at things that we want to do. So it's, you want to see, you want to see it continue, right? You want to see YouTube continue. You want to see Facebook continue as a good platform. You want to see Twitter continue as a good platform. You want to see Patreon continue. Patreon is a brilliant idea, right? It's, hey, you want to be funded to do what you want to do. Uh, and there are people who would love to fund you. We'll just, we'll, we'll be the, the middleman, right? We'll help people. We'll help people who want to fund you to do exactly what you want to do and what they want you to do. We will fund you. I mean, we, we, will, we will help them to fund you. And so that is a that's a that's a great idea. They're performing a wonderful service. So when that service becomes biased and is shutting people down for doing absolutely nothing that had anything to do with violating the rules, uh, it's not a situation where I just want to say, well, I don't need Patreon anymore. Right. I want to see Patreon get fixed. That's what I want to see. I want to see Patreon get better. I want to see Patreon stick to its own policies. That's what I'd like to see. Same thing with YouTube. Right. I mean. YouTube has has screwed me so many different times, but I, you know I, I I've never gotten to the point where I can say, well, just well, fine, I'm done with YouTube. I'll go somewhere else. Why? Because even though even though YouTube has screwed me multiple times, taking down videos for no for no reason, someone working at YouTube sabotaging stuff, even though that's happened multiple times, YouTube has allowed me to do a lot of what I want to do in life, right? So in other words, they've got a ton of cool points for the things they've helped me with. And so when they screw up and do something that's messed up, I don't say, oh, I'm done with you. It's, hey, I hope I really hope you work on that. I'm going to try and draw your attention to that. And I hope you fix that. It's the same with Patreon. Um, so vocab, have you lost have you lost patrons during the during times when uh when they're banning people? Yeah, but uh, I don't always know the reasons. I think I had one person I remember who said they're getting off. It was maybe two. They were getting off those um, platforms for that. Mm -hmm. And I, I respect their decision because yeah. I understand I, people want to, I think, be proactive. They're trying to not wait too long to in some way be proactive and say, hey, look, well, you know, I did this. Um I, it's, it's, these are tough calls to make. And yeah. one thing I hope people understand is when we mention some of these other groups, our hope is not that Patreon then goes and polices more people and goes after these groups that seem to be kind of on the other side of things. That's not the, the hope or the idea is, oh, like, well, let's get them too. The idea is, no, uh, fix it like you were saying. Yeah. I, uh, fix it. And uh, there will, I mean, you wonder if it'll be like, other things whenever one area is closed it offers up an avenue for legitimate competition after yeah. a certain amount of time mm -hmm. it may not always be immediately but some legitimate competition happens and i'm no fan of fox news i don't watch it but that seems to be a good example uh, i don't listen to right-wing political talk on the radio i'm not 
dissing people, those who do or anything like that. But I'm just saying that's that kind of arose partially because of alternative. Similar things now with uh, social media. People started taking to other avenues. Well, now that's some of that's getting blocked. Hey, a couple of super chatters want to give a shout out to you real quick. Ham Sunshine, Four Score, Yeshua is Chosen, and Arlen Three. Good to see you again. If, uh, if, if any of them are, uh, it's tough for me scrolling. So if you see uh, if you see any that have uh, questions or want to make points, um, go ahead and go ahead and read them off whenever you see them. Uh, like Nelson Gavin said, uh, God is Trinity. That's true. Amen. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, uh, guys, the, the situation is um, the situation is uh, whether you agree with with Sargon or not, whether you agree with <laughs> with Milo or not, um, like like so, some of the people who've been uh, blocked are um, are the alt right personalities and stuff. Um, so you, you may not be a fan of, of their views. The, the general principle in the West has historically been that if, if we're, if we're going to, if we're going to be able to say what we want to say, then we kind of have to defend each other's rights, uh, to say certain things. And once again, these are businesses, they can make policies, but these businesses, these businesses are doing things that, that aren't based on their policies, right? So there is an agenda. There's an agenda here. And uh, as, as, Vocab was, as Vocab was pointing out, um, by, by, the, by the way, I lost, uh, I lost, I, I look like around $150 in patrons today, today at, because of the ban. And for, for, for those patrons who said, hey, I'm, I don't want to use this platform anymore, I am totally 100% fine with that, right? If, if you're looking at this and saying, I don't want to be on this platform, I don't want, because <coughs> Patreon takes a small percentage. So if someone is saying, hey, I do not want to fund a platform that is doing this, that is entirely reasonable. And I believe pe there, are, uh, that people need to take that step. But I also see a different perspective. Um, namely, if, if everyone leaves Patreon, right? Um, if, if all, if all, if all my supporters leave Patreon, all vocab supporters leave Patreon and so on, then there's no incentive for Patreon to change, right? If the only people who, who stay on Patreon are the people who, uh, who are on Patreon's good side on all issues, there's never any incentive for, for Patreon to change, right? Now imagine a world where, imagine a world where, um, you know, it, this isn't the case, but imagine it, imagine it were where Patreon's top 50 content creators um, are, were Christian apologists or something like that. Well, guess what? You, Patreon's not going to want to mess with Christian apologists, right? Because they would hold too much sway there. Uh, so I, yes, there, there could come a point. There could come a point when I would say, all right, done with Patreon. This platform is, is too horrible. But right now, knowing that this is a pretty new platform, this is a pretty new platform, and they are uh, in a situation where they're still trying to sort of figure out their way, uh, I'm in a situation where I would like to see them get that fixed, and I, I hope they will. I hope they correct the situation um, with, uh, with Sargon, because there, I read the details on that. Sargon did nothing that violates their policies. Milo, I don't know. Some of the others, I don't know. So maybe they did actually violate a policy and deserved with, to be banned. Uh, I just don't know. With Milo, uh, they gave him a reason back, I guess. So I did look at this, which said, um, it is because of your past association with the Proud Boys, although it is now disavowed. That's what it said. And th th by the way, doesn't that sound scary, though? Because of fact, it's uh, if it's disavowed, that seems odd that they could get in trouble for that. And they yeah, said that, the other reason is because that's like saying, yeah, that's like saying, David, you were once a, a, a convict and a violent dude. And even though you're not like that anymore, we're going to ban you for that. And it's kind of, kind of like that, right? If, if you're associated with some hate group or something like that, and I don't even know what this group is, so I don't even know if they are actually a, a hate group. Uh, but Proud Boy is some kind of alt right group that yeah. is like tries to be like hipsters. Yeah, and he does say very provocative stuff. I would never say the main guys like Gavin McInnes. The only reason I know any of this is because about a week ago 
he did something on the Hebrew Israelites. Mm-hmm. So when people do something on the Hebrew Israelites, I tend to watch. Now, he clearly didn't know much about it. He was just, you know, whatever. But that's the only reason I know about him because recently he did something on the Hebrew Israelites. So I guess that's his, his thing is he comes on there and promotes, like, masculinity. But I guess they do all kinds of mm-hmm. other uh, stuff too. So yeah, well, so, so, so what, on, on the one hand, I'm nervous. That's sort of shaky ground because the people who identify hate groups – I almost never trust them, right? Because, uh, because I know people who get identified as hate groups that should never be identified as hate groups, right? Like Robert Spencer should never, Jihad Watch should never be identified as a hate group. A guy who spends his entire life criticizing terrorism and female genital mutilation and the killing of apostates and blasphemy laws and things like that. How could you possibly identify that person as a hate group? But they do. So when I hear, oh, this person has or this group has been identified as a hate group and it's very often by the Southern Poverty Law Center, I think, well, that that tells me absolutely nothing about whether this person is a is actually a hate group. Um, But with that said, it sounds like what they were saying is because you were associated at one point with this group. And then you later disavowed the group, we're still banning you anyway. And that's just man, that's that's some terrifying stuff, right? Because that. That doesn't sound like anything that you should actually be banned for. Um, yeah, so really, really, really creepy stuff. And um, there are certain there are certain platforms and companies, and if they make the wrong decisions and go the wrong route, um, it would not hurt my feelings at all to see them. Uh, to see them go under. And when they do, I hope that other companies take note, right? Like if Patreon doesn't, doesn't change its course, right? If they stick on this, on this course of, Hey, if people complain a, a lot about some YouTube commentator, then we'll go ahead and kick the person off and give some sort of justification that has nothing to do with our policies and we'll just kick that person off because a lot of people don't like them. If if Patreon is going to 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 go that route and they're not going to fix their platform, then I hope they fail. I hope they I hope they fail as a company and I hope the next Patreon like company that comes along takes notice of that and says let's not make that mistake. Let's actually make some good policies and then adhere to our good policies, right? It's just like with with Facebook and Twitter and YouTube. All of these companies have made mistakes. Um, But if they keep going that route, then it would not break my heart to see Twitter or Facebook just start losing business left and right. And when that happens, I hope that it serves as an example to companies like YouTube say, wait a minute, look what these guys did. They started shutting people down. People eventually got fed up with it. And then left forever let's not make that same mistake so uh so we're we 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 believe in redemption here right so you you can screw up and we say that vocab how much how much have you screwed up in life i don't even want to talk about it oh i'm just saying you <laughs> just saying <laughs> no i'm just saying a lot <laughs> just point out right vocab has screwed up a lot i have screwed up a lot and so we are not the sort of people who say oh you screwed up it's too late we're done with you uh, it's more like, Hey, you screwed up and you screwed up again. And then you screwed up 10 more times. Could you please learn from screwing up so much and then fix it? That's what we want to see. And so that's what we want to see with these, with these companies, because these companies can do a lot of good in the world, right? YouTube, Twitter, Patreon, these companies can do amazing things, uh, in the world. And so you don't just want to, Oh, you did, you did, you screwed up a couple of times. So we hope you die as a company. You don't want to see that. You want to. You, you hope they get fixed. With that said, if they don't get fixed, you know, if if he, if we keep seeing the same thing month after month, yeah, there does come a point. There does come a point when you just say, uh, "All right, uh, we're we're done here." Uh, you got uh, Ham Sunshine. Oh wait, I mentioned that one. My bad. T. Renee and Logical Goldfish also in the super chat, and um, the one T. Renee said. I discovered your channel because Sargon recommended it on the Rubin Report. So apparently Sargon recommended you. I, I did. I did. I did. Uh, I do remember that. And I had no clue who Sargon was at that point. I just saw a bunch of people popping up like like 
uh, I get about, I get about 250 to 500 subscribers somewhere in there. If I'm not making videos for, you know, a week or two, then it'll be around 250 subscribers from 250 to 300. Uh, if I'm making videos regularly, then that, you know, it's, it could be 500 or so, uh, per day. So when all of a sudden I see 2,000 subscribers in a day, then I, I wonder what happened. And then I, I went to the comment section and lots of people were saying, Sargon sent me here. And I was like, oh, who is Sargon? Because he sounds pretty cool. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, that was that was my first introduction to, uh, to Sargon. Apparently, uh, Patreon also banned a guy named James Allsup. I I, just, I don't know who he is. I guess he's a YouTube I think person. He's an, I think he's an alt right type of dude. I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I think he was making. I read somewhere twelve thousand a month on Patreon. That is. That, that's that's serious. Yeah. I, I'm gonna look. I'm um, I'm gonna look that up again. But I believe that was that was it. Yeah. Matter of so fact, it, uh, uh, Fourscore right here says. Yep, twelve thousand um, per month. Four score says here uh, they took oh, down Sargon. My bad. Sorry, sorry. I just want to correct myself. For I'll let you go. Sargon was the one making twelve thousand per month. Oh yeah, not yeah. James. Also, okay, yeah, okay, yeah. I just good up. That sounds right. That sounds right. Um, um, hey, why am I hearing an echo now? Did you do something different? Okay, it went away. No, I don't have anything turned up. All right, four score here said uh, they took down Robert Spencer too. Very sad. Now again, that's a situation where if you if you if you talk about uh, this, this all sup guy, I don't know what he did. So I don't know. I don't know if he actually violated policies. Uh, but with Sargon, I do know what happened. And with Robert, I also know what happened. And Robert's situation was even more disturbing because Robert's not Robert. What does he do? He talks about jihad a bunch. Well, guess what? That's exactly what I do. So why would they ban him? Um, but that was a bad situation because I was the one who told Robert, Hey, uh, you need to get on, you need to get on, uh, Patreon, and he's saying, oh, but they'll just shut me down. I was like, no, Patreon's different, man. Patreon's cool. And that was back when the only person I'd seen uh, banned by Patreon was uh, Lauren Southern. And I actually thought that Patreon, they, they, they took it very seriously and posted a response to people who were concerned that they were going to start blocking people because of their ideas. I thought Patreon actually offered a very good explanation for why they banned Lauren Southern. And, and uh, what happened there was uh, apparently she went to Europe and they she was part of a group that was blocking boats of people who were trying to get into Europe, right? So boats are crossing, I guess it was the Mediterranean, I'm assuming it was the Mediterranean, crossing the Mediterranean, um, trying to get into Europe. And she was with part of a group that was on boats and they were blocking these people. Now, you can say, hey... These people, you know, they're they're entering Europe illegally or something like that. But looking at it from Patreon's perspective, if you're blocking, if someone's trying to get to shore and someone's out in the water and they're trying to get to shore and you're blocking their boat, I mean, there is a legitimate concern that you might end up causing some people's death here, right? If, if you, you block their boat and they don't make it and people die and or their boat capsizes and people can't swim and people die... I can I can see saying, hey, you know, I'm I'm not stopping you from doing that, but you're not going to be funded by my site, right? I'm not going to have you, you know, doing something with money provided by me that gets someone killed. So I thought they had a good explanation for uh, for that situation, but that's when that's when the company came out and said, yeah, but so so we're not blocking anyone for their ideas or their speech or anything like that. It's only that where you know pe people people have a genuine risk of dying here so they said that's what they're doing but then robert spencer comes along robert spencer's not blocking any boats robert spencer's not doing any of that what's he doing he's criticizing jihad criticizing female genital mutilation criticizing the killing of apostates criticizing sharia blasphemy laws that's what he's doing again it's everything i do and they offered no explanation beyond well visa told us we had to block him we had to ban him and so that was just a horrifying horrifying situation they offer no genuine explanation for why they did it. And so, w once again, if, if they can do it to Robert, they can do it to me. They can do it to Vocab. They can do it to, to anyone who has some people contact 
one of the companies involved and say, hey, shut this person down. And again, we'll survive if that sort of thing happens. But it's just rough. And if if that becomes acceptable, I mean, keep, keep in mind what kind of companies these are, right? Patreon is a company that says, oh, we're the middleman here. You want to give this person money. Uh, you send it to us. We send it to him. We take a little cut for for helping, right? So that's what Patreon does. PayPal does something similar. Um, if we say, well, you know, it's, it's okay. It's okay for them to just say, Robert Spencer is banned from using our service. Where do you draw the line? Where do you draw the line? So should all credit card companies also do the exact same thing, right? Because they're, they're, they're doing something similar, right? They're, they're helping out. They're helping out a financial situation. Um, should banks do the same thing, right? You go to Bank of America. Hey, I want to, I want to, I want to file an account. No, because Visa says you're a hate group or something like that. So you can't have, you can't have an account at our bank. And suppose all banks say that. What, what are you saying should be done to people for the views that they hold? Very, it's just, it's just very disturbing. And I, this is, this is why we have to talk about it. We have to figure out, you know, what's going on because, Again, if you, if you do that with Robert Spencer, I do a lot of the same things that Robert Spencer does. And wherever you can point a finger at Robert and say, ha, you did this or you did that, I'm doing the, I'm doing the same thing on YouTube. So that's why, that's why it's scared. Oh, man. Sometimes this is uh, depressing to talk about. <laughs> yeah. Because, uh, yeah, it, it does... <laughs> I don't think it's a generational thing, but I do notice um, sometimes it seems like some younger folks, a lot of times on the left, it seems like, I'm not trying to be overly political here, do have different expectations about really what free speech uh, means and what it entails. Now, I'm not saying the stuff with, with some of these private companies equals you know, the First Amendment or anything like that, but – like when you hear some of these interviews or talk to some folks, it does seem like there is almost like this, uh, well, hey, we don't agree with you. You're doing this, so you know you shouldn't be allowed to voice your opinion or talk. But that that is a dangerous thing to just silence unpopular views or, or minority opinions because uh, you know they can they can be right sometimes. First of all, and uh. I mean, there's a thousand reasons why, but who gets to determine these kinds of things? You just wonder where where it all heads. And it is, uh, I mean, how many bastions of of some form of legitimate free speech are left in the world? As if there really ever was that many to begin with. Well, there's there's really not. And you got the United States and some other places here and there. And now the Internet's like this global marketplace, this global forum. And so uh, it becomes important as well because there's people there who uh, can never hear opposing ideas to their government or to whatever religious situation they're surrounded with, for example. Are we going to cut those opposing vo- view- views off from them? I mean classic tolerance. Tolerance isn't I'll let you talk as long as I agree with you. <laughs> classic tolerance is kind of – the idea of it is designed to allow people to speak – even if you don't agree with him, it doesn't mean you have to listen to him or support him or anything like that. But uh, you know, you a robust understanding of free speech and what that means. It's a it's a good thing, not a bad mm-hmm. thing, because really it's the freedom of ideas in a way. Because yeah. no one can really truly pr- prosecute thought crime. Mm-hmm. You know, like a machine hooked up to you knows what you're. Th- but when you speak, it's, it's it's supposed to be what you think. And so it's – if you eliminate the ability to express whatever these views are, then you're eliminating the ability to hear any opposing thoughts to whatever is going on at the time. It's just uh, – it's a tough situation. That's why it's good to talk about these things, but you also hope uh, some some change comes. You hope that things are fixed and don't get worse. Mm-hmm. Man, oh, man, oh, man, oh, man. Yeah, uh, th- there, are, there have been a lot of places down through history where – you get killed for saying the wrong thing. And there are places in the world today where you get killed for saying the wrong thing. And part of the reason the West has flourished is 
the, the, the founding fathers, not just of the United States, but of the West, understood that, hey, if you really want to flourish as a society, you're going to have to protect things like uh, freedom of thought, freedom of, expect, freedom of expression, things like that. You're going to have to defend these things. And defending that means you, you have to flex that, right? You have to flex that freedom of speech muscle here and there. And you have to defend other people's view, uh, right to express their views, even if you disagree with the views. And so you don't have to agree what the person says, but you have to say, all right, you know, we are in a society where we protect each other's rights to say it. And so um, with with uh, with Robert, I agree with with the vast majority of what Robert says. Um, Sargon don't know as much. Um, I, I've heard his commentaries on things like the again, like the Kathy Newman situation with Jordan Peterson. Uh, agreed with him on that. I'm sure he holds views that I don't agree with. If you're talking about an alt-right personality, I'm really going to disagree on a lot of issues with someone like that. But uh, if you are not stepping over certain lines, like if you're if you're if you're out calling for violence or saying go kill these types of people or something like that, then you got to draw a line there. Um, but if you're not if you're not crossing those kinds of lines, then hey, if you disagree with the person, refute him. Uh, refute him. Show that his view is incorrect. Um, embarrass him uh, through exposing him, and that's how you deal with the situations. Not by not by shutting him down or locking him up or or things like that. So that's a that's a rough situation. All right. Do we want to look at uh, some of these super chats here? Yeah, I'm trying to see. I'm the looking new at the, ones. Yeah, I'm looking at the comments. So issue is chosen. One thing is we do need more mods, but. I thought I had the ability to make mods, but it looks like only you can make mods. Yeah, can I thought I, I had to. Can only... I make it? Can I make it so that you can make mods? I want to figure that out. Hang on, let me try. I here. don't know. I don't know if if there's some like way you can up my because there's All if right, not if, if, if wake I I can upgrade vocab Malone. All right, there's vocab. Yeah. Go to channel, report, remove, put user in timeout. Uh, nope, it only gives me the ability to remove you as moderator. <laughs> so I guess there's not levels. I think only you can do. Wow, that's a lot. Hey, that's funny. I can put you in a timeout. Go ahead, try it. Go ahead, put me in timeout, David. I just did. All right. <laughs> Let me see what happens. <laughs> hey, it'd be funny if someone came on and, and – uh, just miss that little exchange and they're like yeah you see this david talks about freedom of speech but here he is blocking vocab muslim by choice screenshots it <laughs> david wood blocks apologies friend vocab malone because vocab was going to expose him <laughs> guys i've been placed that time out people be people be tripping man they, they start crying about it a Logic. lot of times well, I'm not saying me, but I'm saying sometimes when people get put on timeout after they, they like, uh, oh, new hashtag starting, hashtag free vocab. I like that. People would just trip <laughs> out like, well, why was I on timeout for? Anyways. Logical Goldfish said, uh, greetings from California. Please do more public talks in California, David. We need you. Um, I go out to California, usually Southern California, Anaheim region, uh, uh, region. A uh, couple times a year, but it's always in my head if I'm going and speaking at a church. It's always in my head that in the time it takes me to go out here and go speak at this church in front of 50 or 100 or a couple hundred people, I can make a video in that time that will be watched by 30 or 50,000 or something like that. So I understand that there's something better about you know, actual person-to-person -person interaction like being right there in front of a person. But what's the ratio? Because if it's like, if it's like talking to one person in person is equivalent to talking to 10 people online, well, it's still no comparison. I should just make a video and, and, and not go speak. So I don't know. It would have to be like speaking to one person in person is equivalent to like speaking to, 300 people online or something like that before I would actually have to say, okay, it makes more sense to speak to an actual, an actual audience in the same room with me. Um, so I still do speak, but again, it's always in my, it's always in my mind. Hey, I could be making videos right, right now instead. 
Like, That's what David the, is thinking when he's talking to for you. For real, even, even when I'm on stage. Even when I'm on right stage. <laughs> well, that's uh, that's funny. I mean, but you mentioned to me one time, David, in all seriousness, about you recognize the advantage of meeting people, especially people that support and are down face-to-face mm-hmm. and that kind of thing as well. Mm-hmm. But I, you can actually – you can totally get sort of bogged down in the, in the speaking thing, you know? Yeah. You can you, you can get kind of trapped in that. You, you you might almost have a blessing in disguise in that uh, thousands of apologetic ministries aren't calling you, even though you do great stuff. And yeah, you get engagements because of sort of controversial nature, because it allows you more time to do videos. But by the way, j- just just so you know, uh, that that has been deliberate at certain points. What um, do you mean? Certain points in when I was making videos, I was deliberately, deliberately trying to close doors on speaking invitations. Right when when, when I did the video um, uh, about Muhammad wearing Aisha's garment, right? Yeah. When I did that, I was actually thinking, "This is cool. I'll get less invitations, and so I can make more videos." That has happened. So it's 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 usually not in my mind. It's usually and, and really hasn't been much so uh, in 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 recent months. But uh, numerous times, numerous times, it's I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this video. It's going to upset a lot of people. It's going to generate a lot of complaints and people aren't going to invite me and I don't have to go out and speak anywhere and I can just make videos. <laughs> right. So it's. Uh, yeah. And then, and then later I, I'm like, man, that was stupid because you actually get paid for going and speaking places usually, <laughs> right? Sometimes, yeah, yeah, sometimes. Yeah. I, I Yeah, I got – um, you know, I'm. it's not similar with me, but just so you guys watching know, know uh, I did have a few places I was going to do stuff at. Oh, yeah. That did get banned. So uh, one – I'm not trying to throw anyone under the bus, so I won't give too many details, but it was a really cool event they had planned at a – a college, a, a prominent college ministry that was getting into apologetics, and they were going to cover some kind of controversial things. You know, they were willing to talk about Islam, for example, at least. And they were willing to talk about Hebrew Israelites, and they even wanted to set up some debates. But uh, once Islamicizes me came out, yep. <laughs> they they sent me a message, and they were nice about it. But it was like, you know, the board saw this, and then and it's like. Yeah, so, right. <laughs> so following my reasoning, I actually helped you out, right? I helped you get less speaking opportunities, so now you can focus more on videos. Man, I really want to thank you for that, David. <laughs> I really want to. Anytime, I'm, man. Just stick with me. Before you know it, no one will ever want you speaking in their church ever again. Yes. But you'll 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 blow up crazy large on YouTube, man. Until they kick us off. <laughs> And then we're in trouble. <laughs> uh, oh, David. Oh, Callum has a good question. And it reminds you, since we're here talking, I've been meaning to ask you this. and keep on forgetting. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're trying to set up a roasting session. It's part of what I promised the people I would give them when I hit 10K. Uh-huh. It's going to be a combination of a, a freestyle session, roasting session. So we'll freestyle, do some things, then switch over. Do some roast, and I'm trying to invite a couple people in the house so they could do it with me. But a lot of people were like, "Yeah, there's it's not really going to be a true vocab roasting session unless you get David Wood." I will roast the crap out of you, man. Yeah, yeah. So start especially working if, on the especially material. if you got that mustache still. I think I need to keep it for that purpose. Yeah. yeah. By the way, next time we go live, I'm gonna bring a mustache comb. <laughs> like this the whole time, but uh, for real, man, that would be awesome. Now, as you guys can hear. I'm not freestyling or doing a roasted session until my voice is cleared up. You know, I appreciate you guys all giving me different advice and stuff. But uh, maybe by next week if we could do it, it's our 10,000 celebration party. And if we run out of roast material, I'll, like, put some old pictures of me on the screen. And we can roast old pictures of oh, me, too. Oh, yeah. I have seen some. Yes. Oh, hey, I'll just go to one of the Hebrew Israelite pages. They got all the all the best pictures of you from back in the day. Oh, yeah, they do, actually. They love old pictures of me where I look stupid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. Isn't, you can isn't, tell, uh, isn't it funny that that's the level of their criticism? Look at this yeah. picture of this dude <laughs> 20 years ago. Yeah, they, they're, they're funny. Yeah. They also, uh, you guys probably don't know, but 
uh, I used to do graffiti art, and I did have some legal trouble because of it. So if you search hard enough, you can find a a record that I that I have some uh, sm- nothing uh, quite like our friend here that I'm speaking with. Yeah, you can't mess with me on that. <laughs> but but this tiny little thing, and they'll bring it up, and uh, it's uh, from time to time. So I made a video on it one time called uh, "Is Vocab a Criminal." <laughs> Something like that. I don't remember. Bad boy. Oh, here's uh, you get bad boy cred. Yeah, here's a super chat from Oni Joe Oiden. God bless. If you consider visiting Australia, please put Canberra on your tour list. Remember, well, we don't get speaking engagements though. Well, they you, would just say, <laughs> you know what? You know what's weird? I get asked all the time to go to Australia. I just never, I just never actually schedule a trip. But I've gotten probably oh, really? probably 150 requests to speak in Australia in like the last year or two. Like all the time. David, come to Australia. David, come to Australia. Hey, Ye- Yeshua's Chosen says, Google banned one of my testimony videos. It's a simple testimony with a biblical view. And uh, you guys see that? It's, uh, that's the problem, right? That's... Uh, Simple testimony. And I've seen that sort of thing. Now, what's crazy is I've seen, I have a lot of crazy videos. I have a lot of crazy videos. Sometimes a a video will get blocked and it's like pretty tame in comparison to some of my other videos. So it's it's clear that uh, he's talking about Google there. Uh, Whether it's Google or YouTube, Patreon, there are the policies. The policies are written down. But the people enforcing the policies are people right and people have biases right so the people yeah it's a person it's a person on it's a person pushing the button that bans you you know what i mean um so there are people over there and people can be messed up people can do some horrible things uh vocab take over for a second Um, all right i got there's a lot going off i'm gonna see if i I can mute this All right, ladies and gentlemen, now that I'm in charge of the show. How do I mute let's, something? Let's bat mouth David Wood and roast him. I'm just kidding. I'm oh, actually going <laughs> to. I'm actually. Uh, somebody asked, how's the backpack doing? Well, keep him right here by my side. Nice and handy. How you doing, backpack? No, how you doing, vocab? You guys want me to ask the backpack what's in there? Okay, sure. Hold up. Just give me a second. Backpack, do you have anything relevant to today's live stream? (sighs) I'm not going to do the rap. My voice is sore. But look, backpack provided us with something. A brand new comic book I got recently. Star Trek versus Transformers. You may wonder, what's that? How is that relevant to today's live stream? Because... Early in the live stream, we kicked off the show talking about the new Bumblebee movie. So if you haven't seen this whole live stream, be sure to go back to the beginning. I gave a little miniature non-spoiler review to the Bumblebee movie, which comes out in two weeks. So uh, there's there's that. And someone else asked. I think it was Miss Piggy. I love what you asked. She said, uh, can we also say nice things about vocab during the roasting session? Well, yes, you can. I'll drink to that. Sorry, it's late. It's it's one thirty here. It's later for David, but it's one thirty, so uh, I'm pretty dumb right now, everybody. Pretty dumb. Yeah, hey, Ro- what's up, Rox B? Yeah, I see you. You want David to do the backpack rap? I wonder if he's got it memorized. I wonder if he's got it memorized, so that'd be interesting to see. <laughs> oh, Voice of Reason really wants to see the comic book. Well, let me tell you about the comic book since you asked Voice of Reason. It's not that great, but I just love the idea. They did it kind of in a fun way. The art's not, like, amazing. It's just sort of a fun little thing. I couldn't pass it up, but um, it's not going to change your life or anything. Um, But uh, it's all right. Vocab, sing for us with your husky voice. Sing for us. Um... (laughs) Do you mean sing or rap? Sing for Ramses. <laughs> you know, actually, Warrior Woman, that that's for real. Uh, today I went to 
choir practice at church because the men for Christmas, just the men in the church, were going to sing together joy, joy to the world. But it's just the men. So it's like a temporary thrown together men's choir. But man, I sounded so bad compared to everyone. But everyone's not like these great singers anyway. It's just men singing. But man, I'm excited about it because there's something about so at my church, a lot of people were there are pretty big. Like it's a Chicano church. People got backgrounds. It's sort of a street church, you know. So like I'm like one of the smallest guys there, and everyone's all big with these loud voices. And so it sounds awesome, and uh, I'm excited about it. So if you want to hear me sing, two weeks, come to the church. Good. I was really hoping you weren't going to do it because I was going to be like, oh, man, this is going to be messed up. And I'll be part of it. You know who loves to sing when he does live videos? Sam Shamoon. All this, he, he, I don't know if you saw, he, he, he did one recently where he does an Elvis impersonation. So if we I, ever I, did... I, 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 I think I've shared this before, but uh, I saw him belt out some Whitney Houston when we were standing in an auto parts store once. Started uh, belting out It was horrible, uh, but uh, man, he he had uh, he was not ashamed to be singing it in front of tons of strangers. Oh hey, uh, logical goldfish says you should create some attire from Act Seventeen Apologetics. Are you gonna set up a uh, like Teespring or one of those? Uh, yeah, what I shirts. What what I wanted to do is like you notice I just put out a a track. Um, on Muhammad and Aisha, we were going to talk about it, but we ended up talking. We probably won't talk about it because we we ended up talking a lot about you know the Patreon thing and stuff like this. But um, uh, made a track like this where um contains basically what the what the Muslim sources say. And uh, if you're watching this and you hadn't seen this, then you could go to the video I recently made on uh, dealing with prison radicalization, and it's got a link to get this. Some uh, lots of people are asking. David, why do you say, note, this pamphlet contains a verse of the Quran in English and Arabic. Please do not dispose of it improperly. Uh, that's actually a, a touch of brilliance there. You put that on there because if you have a verse of the Quran in Arabic and a note saying, hey, do not dispose of this improperly, it's got the Quran on it. Uh, if you put this in the hands of a Muslim, he can't see what it is later and then throw it away, right? He can't say, oh, this is this is giving bad information about Muhammad that I don't like. Let me throw it away. You can't do that. It's got a verse of the Quran. So he's going to have to, he's not going to know how he can get rid of it. He's going to have to call his imam and say, how do I get rid of this thing? Um, so it makes it a little more difficult to throw it away. So that's why we put that on there. Uh, but anyway, the idea was one of the things that I want to focus on, um, especially in 2019, is getting more information into the hands uh, of people. And here I'm, t I'm talking literally, right? Because, you know, I can make a video. And if people want to learn the information in the video, they can jot down references and stuff like that. Lots of people take screenshots when I put a Muslim source up on the screen. If I put a passage from Sah Sahih Muslim or Sahih al-Bukhari up on the screen, they'll actually take screenshots and go around sharing them that way. Um, but... uh you know, that, that's a lot of work. That's a lot of work. And, and so you want to, I, I want to put the, the, the arguments, especially the important arguments, kind of in people's hands, right? And so I've got around, I think, about eight of these so far, um, different tracks on different topics that I'll be, I'll be making available. And that's mainly so that if it's an issue you're interested in, like I got one on jihad. Some people are mainly interested in Islam to respond to jihad. Well, it's got all the main passages from the Quran and the Hadith in a form like this that you can have in your pocket so that you don't have to remember all the passages and you don't have to be carrying around massive multi-volume collections of Muslim sources in order to show people what the, what the sources say. Uh, if you're talking to someone and they want to know what the Quran says, want to know what these passages say, you just pull it right out of your pocket, right? So you can print them out. And if you want to share them with people, you print them out and you, you, can, you can give them out. So um, things like the preservation of the Quran, got one on the preservation of the Quran, got one on a variety of, of issues. Uh, what, this is a little side note, but this is a funny story. 
I got one called, Where Did Jesus Say I Am God Worship Me? Mm. Right? And I made a video along the same lines of the same topic. But um, looks just like this, except where it says Muhammad and Aisha here, it says, Where Did Jesus Say I Am God Worship Me? Starts the same. It's got a verse of the Quran up here and stuff like that. And then goes through, but it goes through. And it shows that Jesus made claims about himself, which, according to the Quran, only Allah can say about himself. And according to the Old Testament, only Yahweh can say about himself. Right. So if Jesus is saying things that, according to the Old Testament, only Yahweh can say, and according to the Quran, only Allah can say, then he's clearly claiming to be God by the standards of both the Old Testament and the Quran. So uh, I made, I printed out a ton of those. And those I didn't, I, I actually had professionally printed. I didn't just print them out on my, on my, uh, you know, computer. Um, but uh, my friend Paul and I went down to the Islam Day Parade in Manhattan. So there's a big parade, uh, uh, a Muslim parade, and uh, my friend Paul is Egyptian. And so he was, people will take them, Muslims will take them more from him because they think he's a Muslim. And so they were taking these tracks from him. Me, they start, they look suspicious at me and go, no, I don't want it, right? But Paul's over there handing them out. And Paul is over there handing some of these out. And uh, this, this Muslim in full Islamic gear with a beard uh, took one of them and then walked away. And then he came back and said, yes, this is the question I want people to have to deal with. Could you give me more? And Paul hands him a stack of these and then the guy starts going around and handing them out and so basically he didn't really read it he thought that paul was a muslim handing these out and thought that these this these tracks were attacking the deity of christ and so there was a muslim in full islamic gear running around handing on handing out tracks on the deity of christ and so all the muslims were taking them from him so all the muslims were walking home with these tracks on 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 the deity of christ so i thought that was really awesome but anyway the, the point there is how do we get information into a form that is makes it easy to access for, for people and, and easy to distribute for people? Because some people will say, hey, you know, pass on a video. Well, guess what? If you're, you know, if you're in a situation like that, you, you, there's a lot of Muslims around, you can't show them a video out on the street, but you can hand them something like this. So I uh, wanted to put things like that into people's hands, but it's a similar idea with t-shirts right you can't put this kind of inform you can't put this much information onto a t-shirt but you can right. put some information onto a t-shirt right. right you could put a short basic argument onto a t-shirt you could put something you know a, a verse of the quran that uh, that tells you that that christians have to judge by the gospel um, or other verses of the Quran which show that the Torah and the gospel haven't been corrupted. You could put that sort of stuff out there. You could put simple arguments on, on T-shirts. So uh, that's another step along the same lines as this. Uh, how do we get more information out there in a form that's easy to to share? Because it's, it's really helpful because if you've got the information on a T-shirt, well, now you don't have to do anything, right? You're standing in line at the bank and you've got some verses of the Quran that you want people to know. Or you've got some verses of the Bible that you want people to know. Or you got an argument that you want people to know, and it's on your back. And so whoever's standing behind you is is reading this, and so you don't even have to say anything there. Your 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 shirt is saying it. So, uh, want to come up with some designs this year and make those uh, make those available to people. Those would be cool because we could also get those. We could also buy them ourselves and like give them out as prizes to people. You know what I mean? Yeah, like uh, do the shirts. Give them out as prizes, but you'd also sell them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they'd they'd be available on a site. But if you if you don't know sites like Teespring, you send Teespring uh, a design for a shirt, and then yes. people who want the shirt can can buy it, and Teespring will 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 print one out, print out a shirt, and then send it to you if you if you buy it. So there are sites like that, but yeah, they'd also make cool cool prizes. So that is a good idea. I still have a few props from Islamicize Me. It could be prizes. I still have some. You said a few. Would... You better have a bunch, unless you've been giving them out without telling me. No, I haven't given them out to nobody. Okay, good, good, good. So you have all the props from Islamicize Me. Yeah, but I'm saying there's some things like that we didn't keep. Like, I mean, some things I kept I shouldn't even have. I still have the camel pee in my fridge. Well, that's good. Well, it, it, every time I open it, it goes... <laughs> like it pops. It's so it's like only a little bit left because it, it makes the bottle like... 
for whatever reason. I don't know why. Yeah, that that thing is swimming with diseases. Don't drink that. Well, camel urine is too, and that's fine to drink. Yeah, water is not made impure by anything, but I don't know about the uh, apple juice we're using there. That's right. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, um, David, do you do the uh, ugly Christmas sweater thing? Are you going to wear one this year? Or have you ever done that before on purpose? No, I've never done that before. I wouldn't mind doing it. Bro, I was going online today, and you know me. Our church is doing one, so I was looking... For one for G.I. Joe, then I looked for Transformers, then I looked for one for Star Wars, I looked for the He-Man, that I got. But while I was looking, I came across one that I did end up buying today. It's freaking Mike Tyson, and it says, Merry Christmas. (laughs) 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 Oh, man. When I saw that, I was like, I didn't look for this, but now that I've seen it. I want to rock. This is what I'm getting. Oh, man, it looks epic. Ah, I got my kids one, though, too. It's cute. It's Chewbacca. He's trying to put up Christmas lights, but they're all tangled up in his fur. So he's like, Arr! No, anyways. Now we all know how Vocab spends his time and money. I do have a job, so everyone knows. <laughs> yeah. A hey, uh, not well. To be fair, I did it while I was sitting in church today. I took my kids to a Christmas party at church, and while they were doing some of their fun and games, I was buying them Christmas sweaters for another church event. Okay, not a verse is here with the super chat. What's up, not a verse? Have you heard about the 200 churches that have been destroyed in Serbia's Christian Holy Land of Kosovo? Muslim territories occupy Kosovo illegally. Self-declared, it is an independent state. Sad. Uh, let me say something real quick, not averse. I've been hearing about persecution flare-up in Nigeria, in Uganda, and a few other places. I have not heard about this. Is this recent? Maybe David knows. I did not know about this. Um, I mean, I, I'd heard about some of the problems. I didn't know the, the numbers here. But, uh, yeah, just uh, I just searched for it after reading uh, the, the comment there. And it says, uh, numerous Serbian – this is an article, Destruction of Serbian Heritage in Kosovo. Uh, numerous Serbian cultural sites in Kosovo were destroyed during and after the Kosovo War. According to the International Center for Transitional Justice, 155 Serbian Orthodox churches and monasteries were destroyed by Kosovo Albanians between June 1999 and March 2004. So that's just a, a, a less than five-year period, um, 155 Serbian Orthodox churches so that is a lot of churches and 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 by the way um robert robert spencer and i have talked about this during during live streams but uh if you read the history of jihad that is standard for basically 14 centuries um wiping out churches not not just churches if we're talking about um you know india and stuff like that it's, it's wiping out hindu temples and so on but uh yeah Places of worship been wiped out by uh, by Muslims in the name of Islam for for 14 centuries. So, I mean, I mean the, the reason this is important is we're not very familiar with that, right? In places like the United States, um, be hard to imagine hundreds of churches just being destroyed um, in the name of Allah. And yet, it happens. All right, I got to get up again. Just so you know, these aren't these aren't terrible emergencies. These are you know disconnected circuits or something like that where I have to get up and go. Uh, go. Looks like he might have done it himself. Really? Yeah. Oh, he, yeah. He he can hook himself back up. Lots of times when you hear an alarm, it's because he wants attention. One of the kids oh. want attention, right? They learn they learn that very on. Hey, if you want someone to come over and and do something. You disconnect your you disconnect your, your breathing circuit. <laughs> it sets off an alarm. Oh and so, boy! Uh, you get an alternate system there. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's that's the situation. Anyway, uh, you, yeah. You so, need to read read the boy who cried wolf to him. Go, go ahead. Yeah. So so yeah. So anyway, um, no. Now we know. Um, and and by the way, um, I'm re- I'm on chapter eight of Robert Spencer's The History of Jihad. So I'm most of the way done, but we're we're just getting up. We're about to get up to modern times, 
and I'm sure Robert covers this in his book because he's being very thorough. So uh, for those of you out there interested in jihad, um, good book to get. It is. Robert's a machine when it comes to publication. I don't know how he does it. All right, we got about 15 more minutes. We'll just take some comments. We'll just take some comments, uh, answer some questions on the way out. Um, Act 17, please make a video about a Muslim women's inability to marry non-Muslims. That's actually, the, the reason that's an important issue is uh, this gets put forward uh, in lots of like interfaith dialogues or presentations on Islam. And it goes like this. If you want to know how tolerant Islam is, the Quran even allows us Muslims to marry Christian and Jewish women. Now, how tolerant is that? And so the, the appropriate question to ask there is, yeah, but can Muslim women marry Jewish or, or Christian men? And the answer is no. And so, well, why? If, if, you're, if you're really tolerant, then why is it okay for Muslim men to marry non-Muslim women, but not for Muslim women to marry non-Muslim men? And if you actually look at the justification for the reasoning in Islam, uh, they viewed it as good. You're t they viewed it as taking over the reproductive capabilities of the unbeliever, right? If, if, you're, if, you're, if, you, if you marry a Christian or Jewish woman, you're taking over the reproductive capabilities of Jewish and Christians. I mean, Jews and Christians. And so it's, uh, yeah. Um, I, I may have brought that up as a as a point at certain points, but uh, yeah, I don't think I've made a video about that. So it might be a good might be a good video to make. When I was talking to Elton Simpson, that everybody who doesn't know is the friend who I had from various things here in Phoenix who I did not know, but later on would become a jihadi and actually get himself killed by security in Texas. When I was talking to him about relationships because mm -hmm. he was justifying the jizya as well the people can't be part of the army and the police so it makes sense that they pay the jizya in part he was justifying it with that kind of mm -hmm. reasoning and it, that led down a trail of elton and i who went by ibrahim i never called him elton i didn't know that was named till he till he passed till he was killed till just anyways uh but we were asking about relationships. That's where the path led. And uh, he clearly said, you cannot have – he said, I cannot have a Christian as a friend. And I said, well, what do you mean? Like we're not friends? He basically was like, well, we're just talking and um, basically like I'm doing dawa, so and we're just talking type of thing. And I was like, well, I was kind of joking, you know, like, well, don't you like me? He's like, no, no, it's not about that. It's not whether I like you or don't like you. I listen to God. I mean, this this is the way he spoke, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, then he quoted, he would quote the Quran verses about that, or maybe mention a hadith. And um, early in the conversation, we had mentioned about marriage, about intermarriage, and all this, and uh, it kind of circled back around. And I don't remember the exact line of questioning, but it was along these lines. Well, so could you marry a Christian woman? He says yes. And I said, wait, but I thought you can't have a Christian as your friend. He's like, yeah, my wife's not my friend. <laughs> <laughs> and he was, but he was dead serious. He wasn't making a joke. He wasn't, and I just looked at him like, for real? So to him, he saw separation. Like, yeah, I can marry a Christian woman because that's not my friend. So it's not, I'm not violating anything. I don't know if that's normal or consistent, but that was what he thought. That's a good bit of reasoning there. Yeah, man, it, it's wild because he wasn't uh, out of control. Uh -huh. In fact, he was one of the most composed Muslims I have probably ever talked to as far as a serious Muslim mm -hmm. because there's lots of Muslims I speak to with who uh, they're like – like I talk, I remember I talked to my cab driver once uh, and on the way to the airport. I think I was going to meet you somewhere. I don't remember, but I said, uh, <laughs> so um, you're a Muslim. He's like, oh, yeah, very, very – I said, what do you think of the Quran? And he talked about how great the Quran was. And then uh, I said, oh, so have you read such and such in the Quran? 
He's like, oh, no, I, I never read the Quran. I was like, what do you mean? You just said it was the greatest book uncorrupted by Allah. He's like, yeah, but then if I read it, I'll be held accountable for whatever, what's in there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so the, he was speaking of the – so a guy like that, I'm not saying – you know, he was clearly composed and cool and chill and kind of – what I mean is the serious Muslims like I would speak to at the mosque and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Elton Simpson was by far one of the most composed – but this is the stuff he would say. Because a lot of the Muslims leaving the mosque when we would try to witness to them, they uh, they weren't having it. You know, they weren't mm-hmm. real happy. Elton was never like that, but man, the stuff he would say with a straight face was just like. I remember one time I said to him, I was like, "Bro, I wish somebody was recording this right now." Yeah. I remember I said that one time, but little did I know, like. And and just 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 tell everyone again. Uh, how did uh, how did he he, he die? Oh. So Elton Simpson and a friend named Nadir, I I think his last name was Sufi. I never knew Nadir. I guess they were even roommates. They drove from Phoenix, supplied with armaments provided by another Phoenician Muslim man who went to that same mosque I would go witness at, drove all the way to Garland, Texas because Pamela Geller and Robert Spencer were having a Draw Muhammad cartoon contest, which I didn't really agree with at the time. And to be Mm -hmm. honest – I'm actually still not a fan of those mm-hmm. uh, as far as me personally. I know people have different views. I'm actually personally not a big fan of those events, but they should be able to do it, and they definitely shouldn't be killed for it. Mm-hmm. You know. Anyways, so they drove out there, and they got out of the parking lot armed to the teeth according to the reports, opened up fire. I think I, they hit a security guard in the ankle, but uh, he dispatched of them both, mm-hmm. and they died literally right beside their car. Mm-hmm. I went and looked for pictures afterwards because I realized about a day later I knew who the person was. Once they said it was a Muslim from Phoenix, I was like, I wonder. And when I saw his face, I was I was like, wow, he could have done something like that. But it was still shocking and a mm-hmm. very harrowing feeling. But I remember I looked, and there was like uh, – in the pictures where they – they wouldn't show the bodies, but they showed little things beside the car when they had those little – it was when it was a crime scene. And I zoomed in on view, and on one of them, I saw a baseball cap. And, uh, like, meaning, like, I know that was Elton's. Nadir didn't dress that way from the pictures I saw. Like, it's bugged out. Like, he got out all armed up with all this gear and I still had his – rocking his, like, I think it was a Yankees baseball cap or something. But mm-hmm. anyways, yeah. And, and, and uh, for people who want to uh, – for people who want to uh, – Zoom to the end of uh, Islamicize Me. If you go to the end of day 30, uh, you find out that that's who the series was based on, right? Yeah. The, the series of Islamicize Me is based on a couple of people converting to Islam and seeing what would actually happen. And they eventually decide that they're going to uh, martyr themselves, killing Robert Spencer. And so that was actually that was a true story. Right. It was, it was based on actual events of someone who vocab knew. And what's amazing is a lot of the people who complain about the series. Oh, you guys were too mean in this series. You, you shouldn't be doing this. It's like, guys, people are actually going out and dying over this stuff. And it's some of the stupidest stuff you could imagine. And you we need to put it in people's faces and it, it, do you have a better idea, right? What, what 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 do you do? What do you do? Because this isn't just oh, you know, just just uh, talk about these kinds of things. If the situation ever arises, what are you talking about? There are people actually dying. Um, yep. Those guys showed up to to mow down a conference full of people, right? They were going to gun people down. Yeah, there, there was uh, anyone so. Anyone at the event, it wasn't just like they weren't targeting, uh, they weren't doing target assassination. No, that was going to be a massacre. If that had anyone, yeah, if they hadn't been stopped, that was going to be a bloodbath. And so, it's a situation like that where, guess what? That's exactly what you'd conclude you're supposed to do from reading the Muslim sources. Um, and so the the real way to challenge that, to challenge the behavior, is by going after the sources. But if you do, say you're, you know, you're a bigot, you're a hate monger for going after these sources. Very, uh, very strange world we live in here. That guy, I don't know how well you know his work. I follow him on Twitter, the Imam of Peace. 
that's what he goes by, and he has a new book out. Yeah, Tawhidi. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, uh, I should get it, and I think the it's coming on the eleventh. But yeah, I got his book. I ordered his book. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, I, uh, he he tweeted recently. He said Hillary Clinton is going to be mad at me, or no, Michelle Obama. One of the two, because I guess his book surpassed theirs on some Amazon list, which is kind of funny. But uh, he he recently tweeted something that was kind of funny. It said, um, uh, <laughs> you know. Islam is is not about jihad. He put you know detractors, and then he said I start talking about jihad, mm -hmm. and then they say why are you criticizing Islam? Mm. Like I was like I thought that was a good yeah. way that he put it, which is a good point. By the way, a couple more super chatters. Oh uh, yeah, let me let me pull up a pull up one here. Castanoa says one. Yeah, and also uh, Nataverse is back. I like your name, Nataverse. I got Castanius here on the uh, on the screen. He says a good Greek name. Go ahead. Prison pamphlets are great for prison jihad and students, but what can we do about the general population? Islamists are relentless and insidious. USA effects are already here. We have a jihadist uh, congresswoman. Um, think about poker, right? Think about poker here. Um, in poker, but if you, if you watch like poker movies from like 20, 30 years ago and so on, uh, like The Gambler with Kenny Rogers, things like that, uh, in these old gambling movies, the idea was always like a skilled poker player would just instantly beat a person who doesn't really know how to play poker. They would just win every hand and that's just nonsense right uh, the worst poker player in the world can get a can get a good hand um and poker players who are just average can usually get away with a bluff here or there even against an experienced poker player as long as they're not like you know panicking or something like that which they won't even if they're an average poker player um they'll they're able to win hands put it that way an average poker player playing against a world champion poker player will still win hands so but what happens well the idea is an experienced poker player has an advantage he has an advantage he knows the odds of various hands and so on and because he has an advantage going into every hand yeah the other person is going to win hands but over the course of 30 hands or 50 hands or 100 hands he's going to take all that other person's money because he has an advantage every step of the way so I'm saying this because don't think of responding to Islam as here's the, the knockdown thing that will destroy Islam or something like that. Right. Um, think of something. Hey, here's a little something that will give us an advantage. Right. And lots of times with information or learning to respond to an argument or um, any little thing you can do, just like we're, we're talking about earlier, T-shirts, getting some information out there. Um, printing out pamphlets, reading a book, reading something like Robert Spencer's History of Jihad, sharing YouTube videos, um, talking to different people on Facebook, however we're going about it. None of those things solves the problem, right? None of those things just, bam, all of a sudden you, 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 you've won. All of those things start to shift the advantage, right? And so that's how, that's how we should be thinking, um, so if you're so to get back to the question, um, prison pamphlets are great for prison jihad and students. As I pointed out about that tract I made, um, there's nothing in the tract about prison, right? That's just an area where it would be particularly helpful because it's one of the moral principles that almost all inmates agree on, right? Like if if I made one about snitching, almost all inmates would would agree on that. You know, lots of the population out out here wouldn't wouldn't care as much, but but inmates right. do. So it's a huge issue for for inmates. Um, I remember I asked you that one time. I was like, "Are there any examples of Muhammad snitching?" Because you yeah. did the one. And I'm like, go ahead. <laughs> um, but uh, so yeah, so so that sort of information uh, that if you get that information into the hands of of people uh, wherever you go. Think about this. So, so the idea is if you printed out a thousand of these and you handed out a thousand of these somewhere, you got them into people's hands somewhere, a thousand of those. Now, maybe 900 of the people throw them away and maybe a hundred people read some of them and maybe 
20 people read all of them, right? So you shouldn't be thinking, oh no, but most people are throwing them away. You should be thinking, whoa, 20 people read this all the way through and now they are informed. You just gave your, you just gave your side in this great struggle of ideas a slight advantage, right? A slight advantage. And so all the little things that we're doing, making videos, printing tracks, reading books, having discussions, all of these things are giving us a little bit of an advantage, but a lot of little advantages add up. Just like, you know, I made, I made the video about using this in, in the context of a prison. Well, this isn't, this isn't, oh, you, you pass this out and all of a sudden there's no more prison jihad. It's, it's, it's not, that's, that's not what it really, that's not what it really is, right? It's giving people who oppose jihad a kind of advantage, right? And giving Muslims in that system a disadvantage. But that adds up, right? If you, if you shift the advantage this way, that doesn't instantly solve the problem, but it puts you, it puts you on the right track. And so if you, if you keep doing that, if you keep finding ways to give yourself an advantage, those advantages add up and eventually you find out that the tides have, uh, the tides have turned. I like your pamphlets. I visited the, uh, uh, a church. I, I visited our old friends at the Arabic church today for the Christmas party, and uh, I had left a couple books there, so I went to the office to grab them. And when I was picking up some of the books, uh, with the books I had left, guess what I found? Hmm. A couple old David Wood tracks that we were, had passed out, so I grabbed that too. It was the one about uh, the corruption of the Quran or the New Testament, one of the two. I forget the title, but it's like I think it has the Bible being corrupted or has the Quran being corrupted. Yeah, who, who, who corrupted the gospel? Yeah, that one. That I one. need to. I I've still got files on all those because uh, we we've mentioned this before that that back when I made those, um, those were meant for like just to be, to be passed out. I wasn't like, hey, people print these out and making them available in that way where people can print them around the world. It was for us to print out. It was it was for us to print out and then distribute. Um, right. But it it would be cool if that people can now download those. Um, because they, the points I put in tracks were the points that I'd started using in debates and finding out that there aren't really good Muslim responses for these, like who corrupted the gospel. Um, so Muslims say that the gospel has been corrupted. According to Muslim sources, the gospel hasn't been corrupted and, and can't be corrupted. But if a Muslim wants to say the gospel has been corrupted, the question should arise, all right, who corrupted it? Because Muslims want to say, aha, Christians corrupted it, or the apostle Paul corrupted it, or the council of Nicaea corrupted it. When, if you read the Muslim sources, Allah corrupted it. Allah was the first one to corrupt Christianity. And he did that by tricking and deceiving people into believing that Jesus died right. on the cross. So point a finger at Allah if you want to get angry about the gospel being corrupted. And, and uh, if you do that, watch out because he might point two right hands back at you. Yeah, for real. And uh, so, um, yeah. But I have, a, I have tracks on a lot of topics like that. A lot of people did uh, bring up in response to the video, what about what about the issue of Muhammad being white and having black slaves? Guys, that, that, that's, that's already part two. That's part two <laughs> of the, yeah. the, the prison track series. And here again, the, you don't have to use these uh, in a prison context, but it's a point that would be very, very significant if you made it in a prison context, that the, the idea that uh, Muhammad was the one of the whitest people in Arabia and they would identify him as this white man, as Muhammad, the white man, and that he bought, owned, sold and traded black African slaves and his followers institutionalized black African slavery. Centuries before Europeans got involved, right? So. Uh, it's important to know that because that undermines, that undermines and undercuts uh, an advantage that Islam currently has in prison, right? We're talking about shifting advantages here. Right now, Muslim preachers are able to go in prison and share a message that resonates with lots of the people there because the people don't know certain things about history. Well, if you inform them about those things, then all of a sudden you've just shifted the advantage so uh yes there 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 are more tracks coming and, and and some of the some of the other things that would help is you know showing the christians how to defend basic christian doctrines and defend jesus resurrection and stuff like that uh yeah we've got all of that 
in tracked form. We'll be uh, we'll be uh, we'll be unpacking those in the coming coming weeks and months. Tracks. We need to get someone who works who's like an Act 17 apologetics meme creator. Yep. That's because that's almost like the new digital track in a ways. I know it's not our thing, but memes. You know, that's like really. That's a thing, man. <laughs> like they could even take little quotes from videos and stuff, you know, with certain images. Yeah. Like, uh, I mean, I don't know. I'm not a meme creator. I'm trying to think of some be cool off the top of my head. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Anyways, uh, someone mentioned, uh, are these "Is Jesus God" uh, pamphlets? Uh, how do I get them? Um. Yeah. Again, I have files on them, but I want to release them. So I'll be posting them on a site and then making a video about how people can uh, get them and use them. So we'll be making those available, but it's kind of me putting it on a site doesn't get the information out there to people, right? Because I, I have one site where it's just for storing files and stuff like that. So I have to also make a video about it. And uh, so I'll, I'll do that over time and post a video. One, one other thing I want to do, because we mentioned that we want to make, uh, uh, make resources available to people, I want to start releasing PowerPo- my PowerPoints, right? PowerPoint files, PowerPoint files, and then a recording of me giving the presentation, because uh, I'm, not, I'm not stingy with my material. Any of you guys out there, uh, especially if you speak different languages, if you want to if you want to jot down my whatever I say in a video and translate it and just give it as your own video, you don't need to give me credit. I don't care about any of that. I'm not stingy with any of my material. Uh, if you learn my, if you learn something I say and you like it, you go out and share it like it's like it's it's yours. Um, so similarly with presentations, I want to start making my PowerPoint files available on various topics and then like a video of me using the PowerPoint in a presentation so you can get your get your your mind around uh, presenting the material and then go give the presentation right you've got the PowerPoint take the PowerPoint download the PowerPoint um, watch me give the presentation go out give the exact same presentation um, give a presentation in your church give it on a college campus and so on so yeah we're gonna make a ton of stuff available this year this next I, year uh... I'd love to see your uh, science according to Muhammad. <laughs> that that PowerPoint. Oh yeah, I don't that know was why. good. Every time you do that one, I just laugh so much. It's like the <laughs> way you do it. I, <laughs> oh man, that was just funny. Oh, I, I, it was cool because I would give a, I'd give a summary after going through, like how sick you're gonna get. And this is before Islamicize me. We incorporated the material into Islamicize me, but. Um, once you read through all the sources and see how sick you would get, so you're dunking your fly, and here are the diseases you would get, and then you go to wash your hands, and you do it in this in this well that has dead animals and used menstrual cloths and human waste in it, and you rub that all over you, and you keep you keep going through all of these uh, all of these different ways you're going to get sick, and so you start feeling a little you know stomach aches so you get thirsty and so you drink this water from a pool that has a dead donkey floating in it and then you're really sick what's the solution camel urine and people just see how ridiculous that is right i mean you just have to say what muhammad actually taught about these things and uh people catch on to how ridiculous this is I uh, got a clever comment from Rescued is my favorite breed. She said, two right hands and yet loved by the left. <laughs> that was clever. That's that's T-shirt material right there. See? You quote, you quote the Hadith on Allah having two right hands. <laughs> yeah. Two right hands and loved by... Ah, I'm going to steal that. I've been talking about doing a series, uh, uh, Man God Monday, where we start reading passages on uh, on Allah being a man god. Um. But yeah, that might be a that might be an ongoing slogan. Did you invent that? Did you come up with that, or did did someone else use that? And I don't, I don't want to use it and then like, oh yeah, that's uh that's Sam Shamoon's saying, and then it looks like I stole it from Sam Shamoon. Sam Shamoon. Even though I steal a lot of my arguments from Sam Shamoon. That's true. It's just the uh, same argument just delivered by a prettier face, right? Mm-hmm. We got a. Uh... 
Oh, where'd that comet go? Ah. Oh, wait, where'd it go? Someone asked if Allah had two right butt cheeks. <laughs> oh, boy, people. Someone asked if you've ever heard of the Zamzam well. I've heard of the Zamzam well. Yeah. So yeah, of course. I know. So I, uh, I'm just, uh, yeah, I'm just looking through the comments here. I believe it has, like, magical proper, magical healing properties and stuff. Um, so if you if you go to, uh, if you take the Hajj to Mecca, one of the goals is to get some, some vials or bottles of uh, Zamzam water. Yeah, that that'd be something you could include in an Islamicize me type thing. Remember, we had that one idea I had. Were we gonna have them get confused? Were we gonna read something about muta? But then uh, they were gonna go by a store and it was gonna say Muay Thai. <laughs> and they were gonna get confused and go in there with muta, like a muta <laughs> setup, but they'd be in a Muay Thai like training facility. That's yeah, one of, one of the ideas that that didn't get work didn't work out. <laughs> Yeah, could be a, a could be a future video though. Be a future video. <sighs> All right, we should probably wrap up now. Um. All right. Any final thoughts, anyone? I'm just looking at the comments. People got funny comments. Yeah, I know. It'd be good to go though, because I want to make it church. Uh, pretty much on time, you know. Yep, it is 4 o'clock a.m. here. That's pretty good because I only got about another four hours, and then I will hit the sack. So I noticed tonight you were drinking out of a uh, oh, I was in, where'd it go? A water jug. Last time we were together, you're drinking out of a coffee pot directly. So Oh, well, yeah, I already drank a, I already drank a bunch of coffee, and I, didn't, uh, I was setting up here and didn't have time to make another pot. Um, but as far as drinking out of a jug... I realize I would, you know, if I'm drinking out of like little water bottles and stuff, I go through them pretty quickly when these are only like 60 cents. So might as well just get a big jug and carry that thing around and drink it. Yeah, I guess I I mean, I think I heard something about people from West Virginia kind of that's how they do things. <laughs> you think people from West Virginia drink out of <laughs> You know, one Drink of the videos we, huh? we did when uh, the camera was off uh, while we were doing a mic check, and I made, like, some pretty inappropriate jokes about <laughs> West Virginia. you like, you can't do this. You? you know what? I, you probably never knew this, but when I ended up putting some of those up on my channel, what I did is I, I thought those jokes were funny, but I didn't want to keep them on there, so one of them – I reversed it and played it backwards, like at the end of the video. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, you could easily see what it says if you just, you know, went on there. And you know, but uh, no one ever said anything about it. I don't think anyone ever ever took the time to do it. Anyways, <laughs> Vishal says, "Could you guys make an Islamicize me too?" It's funny we get this question like every time. Yeah, we talked about doing a prequel. Prequel. Oh, you know what I was thinking. Uh, so, what? so for the, well, the prequel we're talking about because <clears throat> Islamicize me starts off and we're atheists, but particular kinds of atheists, right? Um, like I have lots of, lots of atheist subscribers and stuff and, uh, lots of them are, are really cool. But then you have the sort of angry Dawkins fans, uh, atheists. And that's how we start off Islamicize me as, as Dawkins fans. So if we're doing a prequel, it would be kind of how we became that, and we could really start off as as anything. So we could we could start off that, you know, the prequel as Mormons, or we could start off as anything, right? Um, but somehow we'd become atheists, and then become more and more sort of m sort of extreme in our views. And uh, I was thinking because how we started off that series. How we started off Islamicize me, the kinds of atheists we were. We were we were fans of particular comments by Richard Dawkins in, in which he was basically saying that no amount of evidence would ever convince him that God exists, no matter what no matter what the evidence was. Even if God wrote a message in the stars telling him to believe something, he still wouldn't believe. He would just say aliens did it. And so they these guys uh, it was Richard Dawkins and 
Peter Bogosian, and they were actually positing uh, powerful trickster aliens. And so the, the question is, what evidence could you give a person like that that would convince him that God exists? And the answer is absolutely nothing. God could appear and start shooting lightning bolts, and it wouldn't it wouldn't convince the person that God exists because you could just say aliens are trying to trick me. And so that's actually Dawkins, the position of Dawkins. When atheists think he's this champion of going wherever the evidence points and he's acknowledging it doesn't matter where it doesn't, there is no evidence that I would accept. And so, uh, but we are fans of that view at the beginning of the series. So I was thinking it might be funny if we're atheists, but like we keep getting more and more evidence that we have to explain away. And then it gets to the point where like there are like miracles happening all around us and people being healed and we're being healed and Christians are putting their hands on us and heal and healing. So we have to become more and more radically skeptical to the point where we eventually get like that. Right. Where uh, our hero, our hero is someone who just says, I will reject all evidence no matter what it is. As right, long as right, it's pointing right, right. to theism. And so uh, and we could end we could end with us like walking into, you know, to to eat some ribs. Um, anyway, that's a general idea of how the, the prequel could go. Yeah, oh, I hey. think... Oh, go ahead. What? Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, we, we sort of do have... I have sort of an atheist character. I don't know if John will be the Pastafarian the whole time, but he sort of has... Uh, well, that's a different... No, he can't be. Those character. are different guys. Those are guys I yeah, beat the sorry. crap out of. Oh, yeah, that's... A, I guess I have to come up with a new atheist character. Okay, go ahead. Uh, oh, I was going to say for the for the sequel, for the sequel would be where we're Christians, and uh, at the end of Islamicize Me, we become Christians, but it's just after accepting a, a simple gospel message. Whereas we're messed up enough that we're going to have to have to go through some struggles and so on to really become mature Christians. So um, we'd have to figure out how to how to make it funny. But what would be cool there is we could even incorporate some Islam there, right? Because other people or even Sam Shamoon returning as the sheikh could decide that like we have to die because we're apostates or something like that. So we could oh. still we could still be interact. We it could be not just our, our new lives as Christians, but like uh, constantly under death threat for being apostates and stuff like that. Oh, so there, there's still a lot we could do. Huh? Yeah, we could have like a local guy give a fatwa against us. Yeah, so um and by the way, as soon as we iron out some details, these are things we could do, right? I mean, we want to do the Jesus versus Muhammad epic rap battle. We want to do that in the next few months, but I mean, 2019's coming up. We might want to aim towards like April to record like last time to record the the prequel series, do all the recording. So we'll have to figure it out before then. Oh man, oh boy, oh boy! Now I'm getting scared. We'd have to knock it out. Oh boy, it's kind of rough doing all that because like vocab has to take like a week off off work and stuff like that for us to be out there recording every day. It's a pretty crazy, pretty pretty crazy time. I do have a new uh, facility though where we could record. It looks very different than the last place we recorded. Um, so there's a couple of, like little spots we could rearrange. It's a different, different place, but I got a different place we could use. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have here, uh, Fedor, he says, uh, come do a debate or presentation in the Seattle area. We'll set it up. It's got, it's got no problem coming up to Seattle. That was, Hey, uh, since, since you're from there, let me tell you a little story. Um, I was heading, I was. My dad was in the military, and he was stationed in Adak, Alaska, when I was like five and six years old. And so I was six years old, and uh, I lived in Massachusetts, so East Coast. Lived in Massachusetts, and uh, my dad sent me a plane ticket. I lived with my mom and her boyfriend in Massachusetts. Dad was in Adak, Alaska, and... Uh, so dad sent me a plane ticket to come to Alaska for the summer when I was six years old. So they actually stuck me on a plane when I was six. I freaked out when I got on the plane, started screaming. 
Uh, but I eventually calmed down. This guy beside me started playing Go Fish with me. And so, uh, so I calmed down, flew across the entire country uh, by myself, six years old, and uh, until I got to Seattle. And that's where uh, my dad picked me up. And he took me to the Space Needle, right? We get off the plane. He says, we're going to go visit. We're going to go on the Space Needle. And so I hear Space Needle, and I think this thing is going to blast off into space on account of it being called the Space Needle. And so I, I look at it, and there's this big, you know what the Space Needle looks like. If not, then, then go ahead and look it up. Uh, for, for you, I, I know if you're from Seattle, you know. But uh, for, for anyone else who's watching and, and doesn't know what the Space Needle looks like, you can look it out. Looks like, shaped like a, something that might blast off. So I'm sitting there as we're approaching the Space Needle, and I'm looking at that thing thinking, how's it going to land, right? I mean, it, it's clear how it's going to blast off. It's going gonna, it's gonna to shoot straight up. But how's that thing going to come down? That thing's going to crash as soon as it comes down. So I did not want to go in there because I thought it was going to blast off. So um, there's like this elevator you get into when you go in there. And I just lost it. I started flipping out and lashing at everyone. My dad tried to tried to, tried to, to hold me in place. And uh, his hand got close to my mouth. And I just, I remember biting down. Uh, I chomped on his hand to try and, to try and get him to, uh, to let me go so I get out of this place. And uh, anyway, he held me there. And we got up to the top. And then I saw like those, those viewfinders. You put a quarter in there. And then you can look around. And I realized. I remember those, yeah. I was like, oh, this thing isn't blasting off. This is, this is nothing to be scared of. So uh, anyway, that was uh, that was my experience with the lovely city of Seattle. Well, six years old is pretty young to to do all that. I wonder if they let you do that now. What? You know, bite someone in an elevator? No. <laughs> no. What? No, go fly across the country at six. Well, now I'm 42 years old. What? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I don't. I yeah. don't know. I don't know what the rules the rules are now. Yeah. But that Space Needle does – I mean, I'm thinking about it now that you mentioned – so I've been on it too. Yeah. I was a, uh, I was in high school, I think. I don't remember a whole lot about it. But I do remember uh, – yeah. I could – if you're six years old and you're a Space Needle, that's a really funny thought. It would seem like it would, like, take off. Yeah, no one bothered know? to tell me this thing is not actually going to take off and that the Space Needle has nothing to do with space. Yeah, that's funny because – there's a really, really bad episode of G.I. Joe mm -hmm. where it's Leatherneck, Lifeline, and one of the other guys, I forget who, and they go out for a night on the town. So, like, they're basically going clubbing. Oh, and nice. they go to this club, and they're, like, showing the dancing, and they're all try they are trying to pick up chicks. This is in this 80s cartoon. Nothing, you know, obscene, but, like, it's funny when you, like, think about it through the eyes of an adult. Anyways, I don't know the reasons why, but Cobra had rigged this, this club – because it had some kind of theme or something to it that was relevant to this. Like it was called like, you know, outer space or something like that. They rigged it to make it an actual rocket. And so the Joes are in the club dancing and the thing goes up into space. And uh, they're part of this Cobra plot and now they're trapped in space in this dance club. And uh, there's a part where they had to go from a room to room where none of the – there was no oxygen in one spot. And they legitimately used garbage bags over their head. So they could, <laughs> so they could have enough oxygen to get from one place to another. Anyways, that story just reminded me of that. I'm so sorry. That's pretty awesome. See, you were saying that, and then I started remembering the the episode because we were talking about Transformers earlier. There was the episode where they were in the club, and Soundwave was in the club. Soundwave was the music source in the club, and he started blasting uh, sound waves of like mind control. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, I think that episode had breakdancing in it too. Transformers had a – there's a couple episodes where uh, they befriended some, like, punks. Mm -hmm. Like, they were, like, street punks, and um, and uh, they were all, like, using slang and stuff. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, just – I don't know. It's just funny. Uh, decades in the making said, have the celebrity Halal Hogan feel the Pentecostal fire and start speaking in tongues. No, no, we, no, no. We just need another different wrestler for that. You know what I'm saying? So, like, you know, that. Remember, we talked about guys. I don't know. You don't. We've talked about having different wrestlers with different worldviews. It could be like the by, the we actually had a professional, a professional wrestler, contact us and volunteer to play a part. <laughs> we've got to use him for something because yeah. he could teach us a few moves. We have to. I'll be like. Uh, well, it's not. It's supposed to be worldviews, but we can have a Pentecostal wrestler. 
we gotta think of one. Like, um, like instead of Rowdy Rowdy Piper, but like Rowdy Rowdy Rada Honda Dai. Rada Honda Dai, you know, some kind of. <clears throat> you, you know, you know, is what was crazy. B- both of Sam's characters, the 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 Mad Shake and uh, Halal Hogan. It, yeah, what about him? It, it it takes a lot to to crack me up laughing because w- w- once it starts recording, I'm pretty serious, right? Yeah, like yeah. I'll, I'll laugh if I'm supposed to be laughing and stuff like that. But it takes a lot to actually make me burst into laughter and ruin a scene. And Sam did that multiple times. Um, Sam did that multiple times with his characters. So yes, we we have to we have to use some stuff with uh with Sam again in the future. I think he did that to he did that to all of us. There was oh there yeah was, when, when we we're in the mosque. <laughs> I remember losing it. There's a couple times that we everyone the did the cameraman. Everyone because he, he was so serious. Yeah. And we, and we, and we had no idea that it was coming, right? We we would like give him a we would just say talk about this. And uh as funny as it looks, you you can watch the episodes with Sam where he plays the Sheikh who's actually yeah. giving a sermon and we're sitting on the floor in, in in front of him and he's talking as funny as that looks in the video with Sam preaching with these eyes bulging out of his head and and talking, and you know what Satan does? He farts! He farts! Right? Uh, as funny as it looks in the video, it was nothing compared to Sam's big head being right in front of us, looking down at us as he's, with these crazy we're on the eyes. Ground, looking up. When every time he would go, the hikma! Yeah. The hikma of Allah! Whenever he would do the hikma thing, I just yeah. saw <laughs> There's a couple scenes we kept, though. Where if you look, I I'm looking down mm-hmm. and I'm shaking. Yeah, a you. Bit. I knew you. You're you're cracking up laughing, but you're you know you're, yeah. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> there, <laughs> that reminds me of when I kept on ruining takes by purposely <laughs> letting real. Go. Yeah, uh, <laughs> like it, th- those scenes, and then and then you with the because uh, <laughs> the stuff that normally gets me, the stuff that would normally make me crack up. Is one I can't I can't know it's coming and and two it has to just be like so <coughs> stupid right so with the with the finger licking scene when you said you you have to go to vocab's channel to actually watch this the the deleted scene where I I lost it and oh yeah uh, when he said sometimes to get that blessing you got to eat that messing and uh, man I lost it for about sixty seconds straight didn't I. Yeah, yeah, because that wasn't in a script or anything, and then I did it all serious. Yeah, that was – yeah, he was dead serious. Straight at the camera. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was classic. Oh, man, okay. All right, we better eventually go, man. It's been all right, real. Yeah, we, yeah, yeah, it's a good time to go. It's 4.27. Once, once again, I was pl- I was planning on jumping on here for an hour, but uh, there's a bunch of people on here. Um, so it was good to, good to stay on. And I, I think this is how long we stayed on last week. I think we were on two and a half hours. So yeah, blame um, it on the, blame it on the audience people's fault. Yeah. So anyway, so someone, uh, someone, someone over in the comments who must've come on late asked, why is he staying up till, till eight o'clock? Well, you can go back to the beginning, but I basically mentioned that, uh, um, on weekends, um, I stay up, uh, I stay up all night because we have, uh, two of our five sons are disabled and, uh, sort of need someone watching them at all times we have a nurse during the week but on on weekends we don't so i stay up at night on weekends and then just occurred to me uh hey i'm sitting here and there are people who uh who who are probably still up or people who are in different parts of the world who might want to chat and vocab for some reason uh stays up late so uh, maybe we'll jump on and uh and do a little live streaming by the way for for all of you who are still on uh uh, if you're not already subscribed to Vocab's channel, go over to Vocab's channel. It does tons of tons of live streaming with lots of different guests. Uh, so he's got lots of different guests on lots of different topics. So be sure to uh, head over to Vocab's channel. And if someone wants to share the link, but you can just look up Vocab Malone. Uh, if someone wants to share the link, and I'll go ahead and uh, I'll, I'll put it in the uh, uh, I'll put it in the comment section here now that we're wrapping up. But uh, you want to. 
You want to subscribe to Vocab's channel for future shows. And just so everyone knows, the video I'm working on right now that will be out here in the next couple of days is Top 10 Myths Muslims Believe About Islam, Muhammad, and the Quran. People love top 10 lists for some reason, but I'm gonna, I've am gonna i got a video coming out on my top 10 reasons, I mean, my top 10 myths that Muslims believe about the Quran, uh, I mean, uh, Islam, the Quran, and Muhammad. So uh, be watching for that. And apart from that, we'll be back here. Unless something else happens, we'll be back here next Saturday night in the middle of the night, 2 o'clock in the morning or so, to discuss whatever you guys want to discuss. I'm sure topics will come up. All right. See you all then.